gentlemen, welcome back to podcastjuice.net. My name is Michael Dean, and today we are here with Mr. Big Sexy and Sack, and also part two with Mr. Michael Bland. Sir, how are you, Michael? <laughs> I'm all right, man. How, how y'all doing today? We're, we're doing good. Big Sexy, how are you? I'm doing great, man. Making a few changes in the game plan and about to take over. Oh, yes, yes sir. So all right. Real quick, of course, hopefully you guys have all heard the first part of uh, our discussion interview with Michael Bland. And, uh, you know, it got so good that we decided, you know what, let's link back up and continue this conversation and just keep things rolling. <laughs> so with that said, I'm going to uh, turn the reins over to Big Sexy. But before I do that, um, Michael, is there anything uh, just off the top you want to jump into or, or you have something to say before we get started? No, not necessarily, man. I think I'll just hang loose. I mean, I answered some of those questions that they had. I know you saw on your page. I just yes. gave people, I just responded there. So okay. some of those those questions uh, are already taken care of. So. I mean, I'm good to go wherever you want to go with it, man. I'm uh, all right. Well, and we, well, later we might revisit one of those questions just so everyone can hear because it was that's something. That's fine too. Yeah, yeah I could cool. elaborate, or or yeah, for the sake of those who may, maybe some people aren't on Facebook. Who knows? <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> well, with that said, big sexy man, the floor is yours, sir. Where are we going today? We're gonna go all over the place today. We're gonna go all over the place. <laughs> um, one of the things I've always admired about you, Mike, is uh your drum tone. Uh, the first time I got a chance to see you play was in 92 at the San Francisco Civic Auditorium, now called the Bill Graham Auditorium. Yes. And the first thing I heard when I came in the building, I heard the band, you know, tuning up and all that. And this snare drum hit me in the ribs like a punch. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what is this going on here? And for the whole night, that was the deal. It was this this thunderous tone. Uh, as a drummer, I'm sure you've heard this, and I'm not trying to blow smoke on you, but dude, you have that John Bonham thunder to you. How did you develop that? Well, I, I amongst other music, I came up on 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 him too. You know, I mean, I was always sort of a. I mean, I live in the Midwest, so you know, FM album rock kind of ran everything. You know. When I was growing up, so I listened to a lot, a lot of rock and roll, and I'm sure that has something to do with my tone, um, because really, the it, I guess I've always tried to figure out a way to explain this, but I'm not sure exactly how. But a musician, more often than not, they their sound, is, you know, is almost like their face. You know what I mean? Like everybody's got a different. Like another drummer can sit down at my drums and sound completely different. And um, a, a friend of mine, a bass player, his name is Johannes Tona. He's from Ethiopia, but he moved to Minneapolis many years ago. And um, uh, one night he was playing, well, he played with uh, Dr. Mambo's Combo for many years. Um, and often we'd have people sitting in, and he would always say, man, it, it's so strange, man. You know, he said, the <laughs> other guy, he's, he sits down at your drums, it sounds like a completely different set. And really, that's because you are your sound. You are your tone. It's, uh, it's how do I explain exactly? Um, I imagine that somebody who is a really good, like, batter in baseball, like, there's a certain thing that they're after when they swing the bat. You know what I mean? Hmm. Like, there's a, there's a feeling. It's, I don't want to say it's necessarily something spiritual, but maybe – visceral and it has to do with um controlling uh your power or your energy in a certain kind of way i don't know how to explain exactly some drummers they play in order to make the drum sort of sing and some play with more leverage like me like it's really your ear kind of tells your hands where to go and whatever I'm listening for in the abstract is what I'm, is what I'm, what I'm going after. I can't really explain it. It's just the sound I got. And everybody says that about me. Like I, I I've played on many songs that were hits that are not, would not be, um, you wouldn't think it was me. 
But some people go, man, was that you? I heard that snare drum, man. I thought that's got to be Michael. <laughs> and so some people like uh, my friend John Fields, who I've been working with for so many years, he, he can recognize me right away, no matter what it is I'm doing. He, he can just hear it. He's like, you just, that sound is your sound. Actually, I recently um, had a friend over who uh, will re remain nameless because I don't want him to get in any trouble, but he's uh, somebody who had a lot of recordings by Prince that I had never heard before. Mm -hmm. And he played a few things for me, and he was saying, I'm, I was trying to figure out if this was you on the, on the drums on this, and it was something I heard. But I was like, no, that's not really me. I could see how you could maybe, you know, think that, because it was kind of a, a elaborate and very involved. And I did a lot of stuff like that with Prince, but I think it was somebody else. I think it, I think it might have been Cora, Cora Coleman, actually. Hmm. But um, I think she's a great drummer. Um, but he played me a couple things, and uh, like I recognized my own sound on a couple of them, but not so much on the others. It's just, I don't know if it's the way I snapped my wrist. It's just, it's the intent also. It's like, what are you trying to get across? And I don't think of myself as a person who, um, I don't think of myself as a person who is, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Like, I, I don't show vulgar displays of power when I play, not on purpose. I'm, I'm playing for whatever I'm doing. You know what I mean? But it's the sound that I got. I, I, I was cutting with George Vincent back in 95. And he said, the son, you're laying the law down in there. He, he, kept, <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, wow. call me the judge. Yo, you're laying the law down in there, brother. <laughs> and it's just the sound that I got, man. I don't, I probably haven't really answered your question. It's just, uh, but also I will add to that, that, that feeling you felt in your ribs. There was a young lady, I think we were in Germany and her boyfriend had to translate. And cause he was trying to explain to me, uh, that she was standing, they were probably 20 rows back. It was an outdoor show. And she said that her sternum <laughs> was, was uh, she felt like her sternum had been like knocked out of place by the kick drum. Wow. Yeah. But she's like, you play so strong. It was like really like, I felt like I felt into my bones. And I, was, I didn't really know how to respond to that because I had never really had anybody say that sort of thing to me, but between the way I was playing on that tour and the also the sound engineer has something to do with it. I mean, their job is to translate whatever is going on on stage, and that's how I played, and he heard it how I played it, and she, you know, I felt like somebody had been <laughs> socking her in the uh, where is the sternum? The sternum, sternum is the upper, right? Right in the center of the chest. Yeah, that's it. So you're yes. not the first big sexy, but uh, right. <laughs> I've been told that yeah, it's like it's I people feel me when I do what I do, and that's just all. I give all credit to 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 to, to the Lord. <laughs> I right. He made me who I am, and I've I've tried to do what I could with it. All right, um, sticking <laughs> in that that time frame. Uh, back on the sexy MF video, <laughs> which was a lot of fun to watch, I cannot lie. There was a picture of Aunt Esther passed around. Oh yeah. Also, she happened to be on the VIP backstage passes for for legs of that tour. How did uh, that come about? <clears throat> uh, I don't remember exactly, but I remember it. It couldn't be stopped once it started rolling. That was it. I think <laughs> Levi. Made somebody get a picture of Aunt Esther, and she was up on the. Um, we used like a uh, what did they call it? Like an overhead projector, and flashed that picture on the wall while we were rehearsing for the Diamonds and Pearls tour <laughs> as inspiration. <laughs> and just she was just up there scowling at us the entire time. Hilarious. <laughs> and I think Levi said something in the uh, Diamonds and Pearls uh, home video. Uh, that uh, she she represents our consistency in being inconsistent. <laughs> Something like that, he said. And he, he pointed over and he's like, look at her, ain't she fine? <laughs> <laughs> and she was staring back going, hold it, Fred. 
I think you owe us an explanation. <laughs> so, it just he just kind of became the tool the the tour mascot, really. Wow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Did you guys ever hear anything from her or any of her people or anything? Not that I know of. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> that would have been cool. <laughs> I think, as a matter of fact, I think before she died, uh, the Glam Slam had like a comedy night. And I think it was Rudy Ray Moore and LaWanda Page. It was a, like two or three old school comics. I think she played Glam Slam before she passed. Wow. In Minneapolis, yeah. Tell me about that, because you hear these clips of comedians, these in the 90s and Summer Prince's stuff. I mean, was were you guys watching a lot of you know comedians and stuff like that or something? Or? Well, uh, Prince would watch Def Comedy Jam a lot. Mm. And uh, that's how he um, we saw Dave Chappelle for the first time. Okay. And uh, Bernie Mac for the first time. And he invited both of them out to Paisley. And uh, Bernie was the funniest, though, man. We, <laughs> he showed up, and we were in the studio, and Prince said, Bernie Mac's here. So we all he said, let's go say hi to him. And we go out into the atrium of Paisley, and he's standing there, you know, with his suit on, and he's looking all around. And, uh, you know, we walk up, we all, hi, nice to meet you, man. You're really funny. He's like, i got to get me one of these, one of these Paisley parks. I need one of these. <laughs> But uh, oh, he was he was a really nice guy, and Prince had been uh, well. It was also probably to discuss the um, uh, whatever rights needed to be dealt with, whatever uh, uh, okay. publishing on. Um, uh, you don't understand, right? Yeah, I used to yeah. use some samples of his in the Pope. Mm-hmm. So they probably they were probably going to discuss it, discuss the splits, and you know whatever Bernie thought was fair, and so on and so forth. So I think that was probably the real reason he came. Wow. But, uh, yeah, Prince loved to watch uh, Death Comedy Jam. He was always watching it in Studio A. That's so true, oh, man. Right. Were, were there other people like that that would just show up? You would see, like, other celebrities? You'd be like, whoa. Uh, yeah, from time to time. Um, I think uh, the, the craziest situation, though, was, was with Dave Chappelle. Because um, he had done this uh, routine on Death Comedy Jam about... Um, where the, the where the N word came from, like how 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 they land on that one, and he, he then he continued to do like the the meeting of all the white dudes, order order order, we need to think of a name to call these black people. He did this whole thing where they <laughs> let's call them no gooders. No, I don't like that. Let's call them. Uh, you know, <laughs> they finally you know anyway. So he invites Chappelle out to to Paisley to do an opening set for us. Uh, I think that was... Um, was that that Love for One Another? Or yeah, something? that's what yeah. it was. <clears throat> and we thought Dave Chappelle was hilarious, but I'm telling you, uh, that particular crowd was not his crowd. It was crazy. <laughs> like, he... he I, I mean, I, he, I, I, I don't know Dave. I've met him uh, three or four times, and I, I, you know, when I see him, he recognizes me, I recognize him. And, uh, uh, but, um, I, I think that he would, <laughs> he probably would remember, remember it the same way we, we remembered it, that it was like, whoa, they don't really understand my comedy. Hmm. <laughs> so he just did his thing and got off the stage. That was crazy. I mean, this is, you know, way before anybody would have guessed what he was going to become, mm-hmm. you know, but, um, I guess that's how it is in the comedy game. You just deal with what you deal with. But I mean... You know these these particular people they um they didn't they didn't they didn't get it they didn't want it and uh, and that's all right <laughs> we were dying. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the word excuse me you mentioned something about publishing earlier. Um, this makes me think about a, a documentary that you were featured in a few years ago called Slave Trade. How did that come about? Because it was really really informative and i've told my clients it's required watching um somebody was making a documentary i don't even remember who it was and they got in touch with me and sonny and alan Leeds and you know a, a few of us and they literally flew to town 
And um, we did our interviews basically in a uh, conference room in a, in a hotel, uh, kind of out here uh, in the southwestern, su- southwestern suburbs of, of Minneapolis. And uh, they told us what it was going to be about. And um, I've turned down a lot of interviews in, in my day. Uh, but this one I thought was important because I thought Sonny and I could literally give some cohesion to the whole situation, to the explanation of the, the situation with Warner Brothers and how that came about and so on and so forth. Because I think a lot of people from the outside just thought Prince was crazy. He just lost his mind and <laughs> like, will he come back? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I just felt like it was an opportunity to to give people a little more insight into what he was going through and, you know, what what was happening. All right. All right. Uh, we know you've been playing with Soul Asylum for 16 years or so, correct? Yeah, uh, 15, 16, yeah. Yeah, nice. But at one point, you and Sonny... And I believe Tommy were backing Joe Jonas. Now, I'm not you know, I'm not ripping the Jonas Brothers at all, but they're not my thing. But when I heard you were playing, you three were playing behind him, I'm thinking, I got to go to this show. How did that go about? <laughs> that, that was actually Nick Jonas. Oh, Nick, I'm a, sorry. It was a group called Nick Jonas and the Administration. And that came about basically, it's funny, John Fields was all up in my cornflakes. John was, he produced the Jonas Brothers and he was talking to Nick and Nick was thinking about doing a solo record. He's like, well, if you're going to do a solo record, then you got to get the best guys possible. And that's going to be these, these dudes right here. Uh, and at the time, actually, Sonny wasn't involved. Sonny, um, I can't remember what Sonny was doing at the time, but um, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, he, he was playing with um, there's a guitar player who was playing with John Mayer at the time, David. I can't believe I can't remember this dude's name. He's incredible. Uh, it'll come to me, man. Anyway, he he was the guy who recorded guitars on the record, but um, John Mayer was going out on tour at the same time that we were going out with Nick, and he decided to stay with his friends, and that's that's all cool. I we got it. Um, and then they started asking, like, well, who are we going to get to play guitar? And me and Barbarella looked at each other like, well, who else you going to get but Sonny? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, they didn't really know Sonny. And, um, and they just took him on our, uh, just on our uh, recommendation. Sonny was uh, in, the, in, the, in the pictures on the record and hadn't played a note on it. But, um, hmm. You know, by the time we got to rehearsal at Center Staging out in L.A., Sonny had all his patches together. He had his tone together. And uh, he knew all the material. We started up, and Nick started looking around, and he was like, oh, that guy's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and that was – he. Sonny and Nick did all sorts of stuff together. Sonny stayed in the band when the rest of us uh, went off to do other things. Mm-hmm. And – um he, he Sonny would be guest starring on Jonas Brothers shows over in like Buenos Aires and you know in Brazil and <laughs> <laughs> Sonny just Sonny's a star man he's brilliant he can fit into any situation that comes across his desk <laughs> so um, I mean it was an opportunity for us to be on the road together again it was a you know it was all love man really they they treated us like 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 royalty from the time we you know took pictures to up and through the tour through our entire situation with them i had played on a couple of uh, jonas brothers songs before that so i i was somewhat familiar with their camp and their way of doing things and uh barbarella came into the process like second day into the recordings we recorded in uh nashville at uh, Blackbird Studios, which is owned by a guy who bought a bunch of uh, like equipment from Abbey Road, which is most famous for the Beatles recording there. So he had all these vintage compressors and components and whatnot. He had all sorts of drums. I didn't need to bring anything. It was just they had everything at this place. It was incredible. And um, 
my friend John Fields not only played bass on the record, but he produced the record as well and toured with us on bass. And um, uh, he was engineering this other gentleman named Paul David Hager, who is actually Beck's front of house engineer. He's the guy who engineered, recorded, and mixed that, that concert Beck did at Paisley Park. Hmm. I, I don't know if you know about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's he's the guy who um, uh, got. It sounds like it sounds because of him. I'll just say that. <laughs> and um, so uh, I mean I don't know what else what else to tell you really. It just it was it was a great experience. Um, I I'm no you know respecter of persons or or music in any kind of way that would um hold on a second <laughs> sounds like playing coon train is coming in the back <laughs> man if I could get that on my phone ringing <laughs> nobody would be able to tell me nothing O'Brien <laughs> man you know what Levi played in O'Brien before he got hooked up with Chili really yeah, that's Levi crazy. was an O'Brien. He was like, wow. "Man, you don't know what it's like on the Tiffin circuit, man. We'd be on, <laughs> <laughs> we'd be on the backs of trucks <laughs> with a PA from <laughs> Tim Dusty." <laughs> Get it in. Oh, oh man! To ask you real quick, just in terms, of what was the difference between being on the the Jonas tour and everything versus being on a Prince tour? Um. Wow. I mean, one of the big differences is that just because the show's over don't mean Prince is ready to go home. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, you know, with Prince, we were doing after shows all the, as a, all the time. You, you probably got many bootlegs of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. <laughs> but, um, I mean, but what, what we did do... Um, on tour with Nick that we didn't do so much of with Prince was uh, a lot of TV, like during the, while the tour was going on, like we would fly, we finished playing in Boston and got on like a red eye and flew to LA to, to play uh, something out there, like some TV thing. Like we were just, I mean, always traveling hmm. like by plane. Like it was, um, that was, I don't think it was as exhausting but um, it was, I mean, you know, air travel takes it out of you, too, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was a, quite a bit more air travel on the tour than normally we would with uh, than what I remember having with Prince. Can, can I get in your pockets, pocket watch for a second? Sure. <laughs> so just in terms of like, so what was more lucrative for you guys, being on the Prince thing or being on the journal? Oh, wow. Oh, that's what you mean. Um, <laughs> well, that's not what I meant at first, but okay, since we're okay. I mean, I mean, I, I, I really, you know what? Um, I would say that for the amount of time we spent with Nick, mm -hmm. the money was better. I get what like you're saying. We made more in a short amount of time mm -hmm. with him. You know? Did you guys do more rehearsals? stuff with Prince, I would imagine. Or, or. Yeah, I mean, but I, I also I guess what would contribute to it was that if we were uh, if we were off with Prince, there was a retainer. Mm. Uh, rehearsal pay was different. Tour pay was even different from there. Rehearsal pay was basically half of tour pay. Okay. So, so you just be on call, like you'd be like, yo, come to the studio, whoop de whoop. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, really, I tell people all the time, it was like being a fireman. It's like you just waiting, <laughs> and, brrr, and you got to get up, and you got to go. Prince got a fire. <laughs> <laughs> got a fire. <laughs> fire! <laughs> was there any uh, situation some t where where you wasn't getting paid, or like, did you ever have to? Did you guys ever have to like band together and like, man, where, where, where's our money at, Prince? Or, um. Not exactly. I mean, to be fair, like around like love one another time, there was a lot of live recording going on at really late hours. And 
you know, the union, the, the musicians union, they got bylaws and rules and regulations and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, um, we did reach a point where we felt like what we were being paid was unfair given the amount of work that was going down and the fact that these were basically like two, three hour long recording sessions. And um, so we did uh, actually Tommy, Sonny and Morris and I had a meeting with um, a guy named Russ Moore, who's the Twin Cities Musicians Union. He was I don't know if he was the president, but we went over there and kind of uh tried to discuss it with him and he was just like hey well you guys got a good job I'd say don't <laughs> rock the boat <laughs> and so we you know <laughs> that was pretty much it, the end of that particular pursuit <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean it's always about how far do you want to push it you know? right. and that's with anybody I mean you know we all it's all love and everything but it's still business this is the you know? business and we <laughs> uh, you know uh, me I don't I don't think anybody it, on this planet, I can never say that I tried to take something that wasn't rightfully mine. Hmm. So, you know, I challenge. <laughs> All right. Be All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let me ask you this, Mike. You're uh, obviously a you know high level musician. When you're not on the road or in the studio, you're just at home cooling. What are you listening to music wise? Wow. You know, Big Sexy, there's, I work on music so much. I mean, I, I record out of my own house. So I, uh, I work on music so much, and I never thought I'd really get to this point where I'd be kind of burned out. Like, if, I, if I'm not working on music, I don't want to hear music. Like, I went through that for, for years. And uh, I remember having this discussion with, actually, Tommy Barbarella was the first, first one who told me that's, that he had reached that point. I was like, oh, man, that's never going to be me. I, and sure enough, I got to the point where s silence in the car is golden. I don't want to hear nothing, you know. But uh, I've since come back from that. And um, I tell you, I'm experiencing older records in a different way now. Uh, one morning, I woke up and I opened my laptop and I went to YouTube. I was thinking about Talking Book by Stevie Wonder. Great album. And I put it on, I turned my Beats pill on, and I just laid back in the bed. And I just listened to that record from start to finish. It made me cry, man. I, I haven't, that's a record from my childhood. My sisters had all Stevie's records, all the Motown. Aretha Franklin, they had uh, some of the later 70s Parliament Funkadelic records. Um, like, uh, you know, it's I always had good music to listen to. My dad was listening to Ramsey Lewis and Al Green and uh, Ramsey. Uh, did I say Ramsey Lewis? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And um, Wes Montgomery, all sorts of Ray Charles, man. So uh, I, I I grew up just inundated with all different kinds of music, and um, going that far back, being where where I'm at in life and in the world now. I can see, uh, I could hear more clearly what Stevie Wonder was trying to do. It was, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can put it into words. It's just the vibration and the tone of his work at that particular time in world history. I, I don't mean to get so, you know, <laughs> no, you no way out about it. But, you know, as far as like electronic instruments, uh, keyboards and whatnot, Stevie got his hands on everything first. All those companies would run it by Stevie first because Stevie was, was the genius. You know, they wanted to see what he would do with it. And uh, like the Clavinet, those dudes, the, the, the Honer company, Stevie was performing like in Germany and they brought the first Clavinet to him. Was, you know, we have made this, this is a, uh, this is basically a small, um, what was it supposed to be? It's supposed to be kind of like, like an electronic harpsichord. And they put it in front of Stevie, and Stevie, right away, somebody put a wah wah on it, and Stevie went, no, man, no, no, no. <laughs> and did something like I read somewhere, he made like, he was making these chicken noises, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, we like that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, if you put anything in front of Stevie, some funk gonna come out. So, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, he, um, as, long story short, 
it took me not only to a place in my childhood, but also the way he used that new technology and what he was what he was reaching for musically with it. I mean, there's a lot of piano on that record, but there's also a lot of monophonic synthesizer, which means he could play one note at a time. He couldn't play chords. So sometimes you hear he'd double track. He'd, he'd play one of the harmonies, and then he'd do another one. It, it'd be the same instrument, but he, you know, it's, you couldn't, it, he had to do it that way because you could only play one note at a time on the mono, one. Mm. So you hear him putting these harmonies together like like a string arranger or something. And but it's so weird and otherworldly because it's a synthesizer. But the ideas are the same. It's just oh man, I don't I, I just don't know how he how 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 he could do that. It, it just it was like a uh, something was revealed to me when I went back and listened to that record and I still can't explain what exactly. But it just broke me down, man. Hmm. You ever get to uh, be an opportunity to play on the same stage with Stevie or in the studio? Well, yeah, at the XL tribute. Oh, okay. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was really the first time I got. No, it was not the first time. The first time <laughs> was at the Grand Slam in LA. And um, we had played some concert with Stevie for VH1, I think it was. And. Stevie opened the show and we closed the show. And then we went over to the Glam Slam to set up and sound check for uh, a show we were going to have that night. And Stevie was there when we got there. And uh, so we, <laughs> you know, we saw Stevie Wonder and it was like, whoa. And it's like nobody wanted to talk to him first because we had such a, a kind of a reverential fear, you know? Like, a, a, like, if, does that make sense to you? What I'm saying is like very much, yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. he's about Stevie Wonder. Wonder. <laughs> yeah, that's Stevie Wonder. I mean, what are you going to gonna? What can you say even? Like, where do you start? So that was the night that he sat in with us, and I know there's a bootleg out there of him singing "Maybe Your Baby" with us backing him up. Uh, and before he starts mm -hmm. singing, he starts this speech about you know, like, don't disrespect women so on and so forth. He talked for a while, but before he started talking, he was standing there <laughs> and I saw this happen and I don't, I didn't know what was going on. Prince leaned over and said something to Stevie and then Stevie kind of leaned in Prince's direction and said something back to him and Prince looked like, okay, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> and Prince told us later, he said, I leaned over because I thought he didn't know the words to the first verse. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm feeling uh, and lonely. And he said, Stevie <laughs> leaned back at him and said, I know the words to my own song. Just hold the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Prince said, yes, sir. <laughs> That's hilarious. I guess I settled that. <laughs> yeah. You know? And um, so that, that, that was the first time. The second time was at Excel where we, man, we jammed on Superstitious for uh Man, must have been fifteen minutes. We were just just grooving, man, <laughs> and we were just just funking and just man. We couldn't have it couldn't have been any better for us, man. Wow! <laughs> oh, you, you just reminded me something. You, you're talking about grooving, and I I have to mention this to you because it's one of my favorite moments. There is a uh, video of you know you guys, you and Prince, or whatever. I think it's in Paris at some TV studio you guys are doing a performance for canal plus yes mm -hmm. man oh yeah. my god there's a section in that rehearsal whatever and, you know prince first you guys kind of do the run through without prince and then right we were just making sure it, he, i mean we were waiting for him but we figured while we're there let's just make sure the sound is as good as it could get you know yes yes so when prince and maite walk up there and you guys start up with uh acknowledge me man listen <laughs> When that first hit the little underground scene, I I took that VHS, I dubbed that bitch down the cassette tape, and I used to just rock that 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 acknowledge me how y'all was gigging on that man. That that was cold right there. And Prince picked up the bass and I was like, nah, these guys is clowning. Like that 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 was dope, man. Oh well, right on, man. I mean, yeah, that was that tight. Was just, 
that's how it was every day. You just you're there to make music, and you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that always bugged me out, man. Y'all, y'all was running through a lot of the tracks that were on like uh, "Come" and uh, "Well Gold," and then I guess "Crystal Ball." Since that song never, that's what I wanted to ask you. Songs like that acknowledge me. Did y'all ever feel like it seemed like that song didn't really get to come out until years later? Like, and that shit was hot, man. I was like, y'all did it on a uh, performed it on Soul Train, right? Mm-hmm. I remember mm-hmm. that. Yeah. What, um, what was the Soul Train thing like? Obviously, you didn't get to play live, but well, that was a little, uh, yeah, that was a little disconcerting. But hardly anybody got to play Soul Train right. live. So you know, we didn't complain. We just kind of went with it. Was it cool to be on there though? Like, because that's something I would never expect Prince to be on. Uh well, I, I mean. How do I explain without making it? Well, I mean, I guess I'm on, I'm on the juice. So That's I'm right. Just That's right. I mean, uh, every gig was different, you know, and when you roll it in with one of the greatest artists of all time, you don't really consider, there's not time to consider your environment. Mm. Uh, my mind is always on, on, on the work. And, uh, so, I mean, other than noticing that, you know, they kind of, uh, they were kind of chintzy with like the the way they fed like the extras and whatnot. I didn't really <laughs> notice much. And, like they, you know, I think they got like you know it was like a. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if it's possible. The Kentucky Fried Chicken used to do like a one piece meal. <laughs> <laughs> it was like they feed them like that. Like, Why are you gonna do Don Cornelius like that? Come on. Roll and a and a and a leg. So and, you got a one you know, piece and a smile. <laughs> Like a small coleslaw, something like that. It was, it was really like, wow, that's they really don't treat their talent very well. You know, oh, and then right. it was into the building and back to you know, wow, <laughs> why we came. Hilarious. <laughs> Speaking of that, real quick, just to sidetrack about food. I know, like later, obviously, you know, Prince was vegetarian or veggie, or you know, didn't eat, eat a lot of meat. Were you guys allowed to eat whatever y'all wanted to when y'all was in the building at Paisley, or did you have to like wait? Uh, not after he, he kind of laid the law down. Like Mm. when we started coming back around to record with him on like planet earth and, uh, 3121 and Lotus flower and all that. Yeah. I mean, he hadn't earlier on, he had been reading, uh, some books about, you know, uh, just the dangers of eating meat and carcinogens and, you know, uh, just, he was educating himself. And <laughs> actually, uh, he must have told, he must have really found this funny because uh, somebody came up to me and said, did this actually happen, this, this particular story I'm about to tell you? And I'm like, yeah, that's what happened. We were in, um, <laughs> we were in rehearsal, and Prince all of nowhere was just like, you and Sonny need to stop eating that meat, man. It's bad for you. You know, they don't, the, you know, the FDA... They, they don't really, you know, account for, you know, certain practices and so on and so forth. And, you know, I, I got, the, you know, we should we should discuss it. And and I said to President, well, and this would only be funny to people who are from Minneapolis. <laughs> oh, friends. Well, you know, so Sonny, Sonny and I, we're going to be at J.D. Hoyt's later on, man, if you want to discuss it. And <laughs> J.D. Hoyt's is a steak and chop restaurant. <laughs> And Sonny couldn't hold his laughter, so he's over there <laughs> la- <laughs> laughing into his into his hand. <laughs> and Morris's shoulders were going up and down, and Prince like, oh, oh, I see. Oh, all right then. I, I see how it is. And uh, apparently he was highly amused by that, but you know, he didn't let on to, to us. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's like I wasn't ready to hear it. These days, I you know, I mean it, it wasn't like he was wrong. It's just, you know. Uh, Change takes a while. You know? For sure. For sure. And, um, and, you know, he wasn't wrong, but I was, I was like, I, listen, you know, you can tell me what to play, but you're not going to tell me what I'm going to have for dinner. <laughs> 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 I hear that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> this interview is crazy, man. This, oh, wait, you start. <laughs> I, I'm well, just realizing, like, what are people going to say when they hear all this? Oh, man. It, you know, we're just keeping it on. We're not, it ain't no lies being told. No lies. No lies. <laughs> um, real quick, too, and I, and 
I think somebody was asking this. I know I wanted to ask this. Um, there's been a lot of uh, musicians and singers that have come through, even through your time. Um, and then there was albums like, you know, the Carmen Electra. Uh, you guys did something with Noni Gay. Uh, My Tay. And that may be something that I'm, my mind is flashing, not picking up at the moment. But in, in terms of the ladies, you being in the band, you the drummer, you know, obviously you, you probably play on a lot of different things. Did you ever see like, uh, and this we getting a little chatty patty. I, I'll put that out there. Right um, was oh, there any kind of, do you ever see any kind of tension with, uh, you know, different associates that came through uh, and, you know, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to say. <laughs> well, there's a lot of ladies that was coming through, and yeah. it seemed like you, you, some of them, you don't. What are they saying, Ghostbusters? You don't want to cross the <laughs> cross the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you want to make sure that you in your session, and then coming to your session. Was every did you, as a person in the background, as a man back there, were you, were you, would you sit back and be like, okay, Prince, I, I see you. Yeah. You know what? Without saying too much, because you're, sure. you're about to step over the line, Michael. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm, oh, I'm slightly oh. chatty patty, and, and you can t let me know. You this know. is what I'll tell you, is that <laughs> I've never seen somebody, somebody so cool and, and, uh, and relaxed in a situation like that in my entire life. Okay. Say Prince no was more. unshaken. Say no more. He, he was on That's his own. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just try, you know, I, I like to take notes for uh, Mac lessons for later. Well, and so, I mean, if you, I think uh, like, like any other situation, if you, if you're accustomed to being in it, then you can predict, you know, what, what could happen. And how you're going to respond? Mm. So, you know how um some people just can go anywhere they want because they got this sort of confidence in in how they come in a place. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like people's gotten backstage just because they make you know they they get themselves they they walk in like they belong there. Right, right. Like if you don't if you don't uh, wear the tension on the outside. Then nobody knows the difference. Hmm, I got you. So if you're always cool, then they don't look like anything's wrong. Got it. Got it. Say no more. Okay. There's nothing to see. <laughs> Smooth. Smooth. <laughs> didn't you read That's my book on Mac lessons, right? Come on. <laughs> What's that, Big <laughs> didn't, didn't you read my book on Mac lessons? Come on. Uh, right? I yeah. must have missed a chapter. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Did you read my book? Iceberg Slim ain't got nothing on me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I started it. I just took it to the next level. <laughs> that's hey, that's all right, man. That's why we're here. I mean, I'm I'm telling you what I can tell within you know. Oh, for sure. You know, I'm not. I, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here to put 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 all that on front street. I mean, yeah. I'm, I you know I, I I got along more or less with with everybody and anybody that came through the camp. I, I, you know, I didn't really have much of a problem. You said much. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> people are people. People are people. I, yeah, man, exactly. listen. I, man, I was not always, you know, a, a model citizen myself, man. Really? There days, days when I felt myself a little, a little too strong. Mm. And, you know, and, and so, you know, it's. That's a stressful environment, man. It make you come out of yourself sometimes. I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you guys run out. I go again, just the same way you you mentioned about Stevie Wonder and like what do you say? That's you know, for me, I look at it like, you know, and I look at a prince or even you to a degree, I'm like, you know, man, these guys are on a whole other thing with it, like, you know, it's so amazing. So I can imagine sort of the pressures or, you know things that can build sometimes when you're at high, you're working at a very high level. Yeah. And you're also, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you live in the people, you know, more mm, or less. True. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it was just, it was, <laughs> I mean, Sonny, Tommy and Morris and I, we went everywhere together. 
It was the four of us in the limo, four of us at sound check, four of us, you know, wherever we were at. It was just, it was us. And, you know, it just, you know, we didn't all always act right, <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but we always, we always had love. Whatever was there got squat, you know. Now, where, where was, you know, was, was Maite, obviously she was in the group too, like, would she just kind of be with Prince or by her on, by, on herself? Because would you guys travel? Would you guys travel separately or all together? Well, usually we'd be on a, on a separate bus, the four of us. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, sometimes Prince would ride. Sometimes my team would ride. But she was mostly, mostly with him. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, that was something else. Real quick. Uh, Oh, you! I wanted to jump to one of these questions you answered online, but I thought it's something a lot of people might want to hear. And it was in regards to, I believe, something Kanisa had asked. And shout out to Kanisa. She does uh, one of our other podcasts, Used to the Pharaoh. I think she was asking something in regards to um, you, Prince, and Sonny possibly doing like a, a trio project at some point based off of, I think, something the Dreamer what you did on Jay Leno or something like that. And you were kind of mentioning that you, there was some conversation possibly of doing that. Well, we played a, we, after we did Leno, we did play a trio show. Remember when Prince had those three shows in the, the LA or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. In, yeah. Mm. What was the Staples Center? I think. I thought one was like a, a smaller type of club or something. It was the Conga room, which is in Conga the Staples room. Okay. Center. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. The Sheila E's club. And, okay. Well, yeah, we played. He played three shows that night. He played uh, one that was, I think, just mainly instrumental. Another one where he played uh, quite a few hits, and then he did this trio gig with me and Sonny. And um, uh, after that, he had the offer to go to, to the play the Montreux Jazz Festival, and he wanted to do the exact same thing that he did at the Staples Center there in Switzerland. So. Um, you know, we started talking, you know, uh, money and this and that and scheduling. And I'm, you know, I was, I've been in Soul Asylum since 2004, 2005. And, um, I, it was supposed to happen in the summer. And I, I, uh, I, I, um, for me to have to find somebody else to, to do that gig at the time would have been difficult. And, you know, the, the entire thing would have had to have been worth it, not only, you know, monetarily, but it would have, have had to make sense. Like, nobody could lose out. And um, I, uh, I just, I pretty much just backed out. I, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. And, um, but Prince and Sonny were going to do it with a different drummer. I was saying to Kamisa that, um, one of the days, they, the last day that they were trying out drummers, somebody came in and told Prince that Michael Jackson had died. And that pretty much ended all of that. You know, he, 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 he broke down there with Sonny and they were just kind of, kind of the two of them, you know. And uh, hmm. I, I, we really didn't uh, make any other attempts to play as a trio after that. Um, we, we did... Uh, go back into the studio though for uh, Lotus Flower and um, that was but that was kind of the end of the trio thing. the next time that I was threatening to to rejoin the band was supposed to be me Cassandra uh, Goucher on bass and um, uh, Jubu Smith brilliant guitar player Hmm. And um, again, it came down to a, a matter of scheduling. It's like once you get out of that cycle of working, while you're working for Prince, at least when I was on the regular, pretty much whatever was happening with that situation affected everything else in my life. Like that had to come first. And uh, that's why I would tell people, like, that's a young man's game. You've got to have a life to give Prince. If, if you're going to be involved in that situation. He wasn't so hardcore later on, but he was somewhat indecisive about when the tour was going to happen. And um, I couldn't get enough details to, to, to say yes, really. 
I mean, I'm, I'm out. So my life has taken on a different shape. I can't just, I couldn't just go and come at, you know, at his convenience. So, this, this last time you speak of, when, when was this like in time reference that you see? So? I want to say maybe 2011. Okay. I want to say that 2011 or 12. And that was the last time you had seen Prince in person? No, no, no. Oh. I, 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 we continued to do recording sessions with him on and off. I, we did a session with Maceo and uh, Greg Boyer and this trumpet player, I think his name was Ray. And he was like, uh, his uncles were like in the Booyah tribe. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Booyah tribe from like L.A.? Booyah? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and um, he wore his hair like that. He was bad on trumpet. And um, it was the three of them and Sonny and me and Prince. And it was all like throwback, like Little Richard type music. Really? Like some of it was kind of like early James Brown also. But it was like, man, we must have jam, jammed on like, you know, 10 or 12 like different, different things that night. I don't know if that's ever coming out. <laughs> wow. But it was cool. Prince played piano the whole time, man. It was, man, it was happening. It was just instrumental stuff? Uh, he was kind of, you know, singing here and there, this and that. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think he probably would have, um, uh, if he made anything out of it, he probably would have overdubbed the vocals later. Interesting. Yeah. You said this was the last time you played with him? No, that was not oh, the last oh, time. That oh, was okay. just one thing that happened. The last time was... Uh, probably about a month before he passed and he was working on a jazz fusion record and I came in and um, uh, that was the first time I got to play with Mono but I didn't get to meet him because he, <laughs> uh, Mono was in the in the control room and I was in the drum booth like way out in, in Studio A mm. and I came in and I just kind of went to the drums and I didn't know that there was a bass player there until, <laughs> until he started playing <laughs> And I was like, oh, and nobody bothered to introduce us, and we just played, and, uh, and that was that. <laughs> wow. Wow. What, but, um, yeah, that was the last time, and I mentioned to, I think I was telling Kamisa or somebody earlier today, but I remember looking at his face, and it seemed like, you know, in his, uh, in the area, like, underneath his eyes and kind of surrounding his nose, it looked kind of sunken. Like, he didn't look well, but he kind of looked like he always did when he'd been up for several days in a row, you know, yeah. and doing his thing. So I didn't think anything of it. But over the next few days, I kept thinking, well, he looked really frail. But I didn't, you know, I didn't think what was going to, what happened was what was going to happen, you know. Wow. Did, were, were you, well, how do I ask that? Of course, I would imagine we were all surprised, but um, you being around him before, had you ever seen any signs that he had health things ever when you were around? Um, I only, only when he started to, when he uh, did the splits, that was that tour where he had Shaka Khan out with him. He did the splits one of those nights and geez, something happened. And he was walking around with a cane for a little while after that. And um, somebody told me that he went to the doctor. And the doctor said, if you keep doing the splits like that, you're not going to be able to walk. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I, my understanding is he did have surgery on one hip. And he was supposed to have surgery on the other. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think he, uh, this is completely hearsay. Sure. I don't, I don't know any, any of the facts. I just remember... When he start, started wearing flats, like stopped wearing those high heel shoes all the time and started, you know, he changed his footwear and he it started to develop a limp. Mm. But um, as far as any sort of substance abuse, no, I, I, there was no way I would have known. Mm. Where, where were you at when you heard the news about his past? Uh, I was at home and... Uh, Somebody texted me and said, did you hear about, about, did you hear they found a body in, in Paisley Park in the, in the, um, in the elevator? I said, no, this was like 10 or 11 in the morning. And, um, 
I said, ah. And they were like, well, do you think maybe it's a, you know, uh, some kind of hoax? I'm like, I don't know, man. And then I got up and turned on the news and whatnot, and they were talking about it, and people were phoning in, and there was all sorts of, you know, uh, just a, a, a lot of a, a lot of discussion going on. Um, yeah, it just it just didn't seem like it was possible. Like I, I just had trouble believing it, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you and you had just seen him a month prior. Yeah, yeah. And I hadn't heard about the situation where they had to stop the plane in Moline and whatnot. Oh, okay. I didn't. I hadn't heard about any of that. Interesting, man. That's okay. Uh, stumped me for a second there, but. Uh, big sexy. Did you have anything? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> you know, um, I was just over here. <coughs> oh God, excuse me. Having a little sip of my nice cool beverage, and I'll give a shout out real quick to uh, the lovely and talented Jackie Thompson. Hooked me up with some uh, Revel Tequila. They do great work there, and it's smooth and sexy, just like me. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> you doing promos? And shit. I, 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 that's why I was quiet. I thought maybe this is his gig. Shit, where, I, no, I no, got, no, where's no. my check? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Did you get paid for that? <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet, but we can work something out. Okay, we <laughs> Billy D voice. <laughs> uh. All right. Well, um. Oh, here's a here's a question. One of the questions from the view uh, listeners, Michael Madison. Uh, he asked, "What did you think of Prince as a drummer?" Um, I thought he was real inventive. Actually, he he liked a lot of the same drummers that I did. Uh, Dave Garibaldi from Tower of Power was one of my favorites too. So I recognized in his style of drumming that he really does that too. So, um, um, I I liked the way he played. Um, he, um, I mean, clearly I, I had to adopt some of his ways and some of his style mm. to, to, to play in the band. So, you know, was I, there, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just saying it's just, yeah. I, I mean, yes, I, I, I dug his play. You know what? I want to follow up on that. Um, Mike mentioned, <clears throat> or Mike. Michael Bland, excuse me, mentioned David mm-hmm. Garibaldi. Now, when you joined the band, did you go back and listen to, like, because, you know, drummers know drummers better than anybody else. Did you listen to, like, technical differences between, you know, yourself and Sheila and Bobby before you when you joined the band? Or did oh, you just sure, yeah. jump in I, there I, and I was, rip it? No, 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 no. Uh, that would be irresponsible as far as I'm concerned. If you're joining an ensemble and uh, if there's a history that, that's gone on long before you, you got to know what happened before you get there. You got to, your, what you play needs to be an extension of what's happened beforehand. Like you start with, with where, where it left off, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, yeah, for me, I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I had to play some of what they played, you know, really in order to stay consistent with some of the arrangements. And, you know, I cherry pick to a certain degree. But um, Prince never really, he didn't, he, from time to time he might say something, but, but not a lot. I remember um, Levi and Miko both kind of in the middle of rehearsal for the new tour. They were like, man, they were like, Prince must really dig you, man. <laughs> and I said, why? And they said, thank you. And they said, you know, he uh, he was always, uh, you know, pushing cats off the drums, pushing, you know, getting back there like, let me play. Like, <laughs> making Sheila get up where he could sit down and play. And it's like, he ain't gone near your set. And we've been rehearsing for, you know, <laughs> three weeks. So, you know, that just let me know that I was doing, do, doing right by him. Because you know, he didn't feel the need to sit down and reinterpret how I was giving it to him, so... Huh, that's interesting. Did you ever see him do that with other musicians? Um, I mean, by the time I got in, 
But I mean, Levi and Miko had been there for years. Mm. And, uh, you know, and Sonny was more or less his mentor. So, you know, whenever he played bass, he, it was more to complement what Sonny was playing. Um, mm. You know, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much a matter of him going like this. Sometimes uh, with the keyboards, like, there may be uh, certain things. He'd reach over uh, either Morris's rig or Tommy's rig and say, it's actually more like this chord. He'd show them the difference between what they're playing and what it's supposed to be or, you know, certain things we couldn't hear on the record that he would say, no, this is actually this, this inversion, you know. So he, he could do that with, with, with all of us. But um, it didn't happen often. And I'm just curious, like, how does it work? Like, if you guys are going to work on, so, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to rehearse for this tour, does he just sort of come up with, this is the run of right now what I want the set list to be or just a general idea and then he gives that to you and you study it or do you guys just start from scratch all together sitting there and learn it as you go how does that process work um I mean it really was more of a we we spent a lot of time uh playing with the arrangements and you know and he'd start with a list and we we'd go to whatever he wanted to go through that day and um, a lot of musical direction was when I was there was Levi. Levi was basically the MD, and so he had all sorts of ideas about what to do because he'd go to, you know, all these other shows, all these black shows, and come back like, "We gotta do this. We gotta do something like that." I went to see Guy. They had three drum machines and a drummer on top of that. <laughs> yeah, He's like man, we gotta somehow we gotta we gotta you know get this fatten this up. We need to you know. Like he was very interested in, you know, hip hop and, and, you know, modern R and B. And so he was always, once he got to take charge like that, it's just that things just got more, it just turned everything further and further in that direction. You know, it was, we were more like a, like a, like a rhythm and blues show band mm -hmm. than, you know, like, uh, the revolution, which was kind of a cold, you know, rock sort of, you know, it wasn't a very funky situation. Here, here you go know. the comments. Are they coming for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, just, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's, How dare that's, you? that's what he, that's, he would say of, of an own admission. You know, he said that that's not what, what they really did. They did something else, you know, and it showed. I mean, they, you know, nobody can take away w w what, what they managed to accomplish. They they went to the moon, right? Right. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but I think that it, it, all things being equal, when he had to push through, uh, like the kind of like the the bad sales of like Love Sexy, like that late eighties run, like he really needed us to push through all that, like to come out the other side of it with like diamonds and pearls and this whole you know, cohesive unit, you know, where the musicianship was, you know, more peer-like and where he relied on the band more to interpret the music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I really think that that was what we did for him is, is uh, um, take him out of that slump that he was in right there. I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't call it a slump, but kind of, sort of. I mean, Batman was huge, but I mean, I, and it's one of my favorite records. But I, I feel like um, the size of the, it was a it was a sociological phenomenon anyway, you know. And I think that may have bought him some time and gave him a chance to sort of figure things out. And then we came along, and then he figured out what what to do with us, you know. Mm -hmm. What what's um? I remember like when the song "Get Out" came out. Like to me, that was such a change because it, it felt like and at the time I was heavy into you know hip hop in terms of you know producing all that kind of shit and I was like yo Prince he got it like he, he got that sound like he is this is some legitimately ill hip hop style it don't sound like it's pretending you know what I mean like it sound like it was organically tight like how did that guy did that come how did that come out from your perspective um was there were there different versions of that song as it progressed to what we heard as the release version? 
Yeah, as a matter of fact, I saw uh, one of those versions. The early version was out on vinyl. Somebody's got it. Um, but it it uh, it didn't have like the in vogue loop. Mm-hmm. It didn't because in Get Off you hear this. <laughs> That's uh, hold on to your love. Was that a little bit of LL Cool J in there, Carl? <laughs> system. Um, I don't know that there's any LA in there. Or, or I saw LL in there, rather. So. Okay. But um, I remember that being one of the main differences. Like, we already kind of had the beat going and that anvil on to for that bing, bing. Like, that was all cool and that was all, all heavy. But it wasn't really, the track didn't have uh, the locomotive property that he was looking for. So I think he teamed up with somebody, some DJ. And they dropped in that in vogue loop, and mm. you know Levi probably had something to do with it also. But I mean, he was he was really uh, searching and experimenting, you know. Yeah, that was, and he came up with a winner. <laughs> yeah, that was a headbuster, man. Yeah, um, man, we went we went to Jack the Rapper and played that in Atlanta, man. Jack the Rapper, <laughs> some people went <laughs> off. <laughs> wow! Wow! Um. Yeah, that and just to, to going back to that album again, like, um, because there's like a version of that, like an early version of that album that kind of leaked out there a few years ago. It's very interesting to hear how some of those songs, the slightly different mixes and this little different things going on mm-hmm. in there. Um, for you, like being in it, do do you do you get like a cassette or whatever where you hear it and then like as the process of doing these songs, he's like, Oh, you know, come in and we're changing this part. Or do you just hear it when the album come out and you're like, Oh, I didn't know that's how it was going to sound. Was, was any of it a surprise? Uh, yeah. Okay. It was, it was always a surprise. I mean, they were really, they really didn't want any bootlegs, you know, leaking out. So, uh, there was a time like during the Freebie bridge where, I would just get a cassette of just my drum parts <laughs> oh, wow. for songs and nothing else, just the drums, you know, in the event that, you know, was uh, misplaced or stolen or, you know, I was going to try to do something with it. So they were very, they kept that all like close, you know, like, oh, e- even, even we didn't have access. Okay. Yeah. Or what would happen was a Levi would, have a cassette that Prince gave him. We'd come into rehearsal and say, "This is how this sounds. This is now we gotta, you know, we gotta figure out how to play this." Mm. A little some of that too. What's what's a what's a what's a thing about Prince that you think most people don't know about him? Like something about him that most people um, wouldn't even, would be surprised that he was he did this or he was like that or. Wow. Um, I, wow. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure, man. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know how much would be, would really be a surprise to anybody. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, his, I, you know, a lot of his proclivities and ways are, are pretty, you know, pretty known like people have talked a lot but um nothing particularly comes to mind right now gotcha gotcha yeah is there something that you would want you want people to know about prince oh you know what sure and this is a very important lesson that i learned from from watching how he did things um it's well known that people came in and out. It was like a revolving door there. Like as far as like we'd have uh, well known top of the industry engineers come in, you know, with an open ended ticket, you know, to come you know, he Prince would hear a mix on the radio and go, I'd like I'd like to see what that guy could do with my music. And he'd, you know, fly him in from wherever, LA, New York, wherever they came from. And um, he would see what happened and you know sometimes they'd stay for a while and uh sometimes they'd go back within a couple days maybe maybe even same day you know but what i always noticed whether it was that or any other situation if prince could immediately at whatever point that he could see that this wasn't going to work any further 
he was always so polite. Mm. He was always so courteous and, and really gracious. And, you know, as a young person, you know, I, I often it ended, you know, situations, <laughs> similar situations with like, I, I was very um, kind of a hothead when I was uh, younger about music. Like I didn't like people to be nuts enough around me, <laughs> you know, and it took me quite a while to realize that people don't learn the same. People don't, people don't have the same, you know, people don't hear the same people. Don't, it's like, it's really just me. And I've, I've been imbued with a, a, a lot of, uh, I got a lot of, a lot of, I'm gifted in ways that a lot of people aren't. Like I, I happen to play drums all right. But I also have perfect pitch, so it means I can hear when people are messing up around me. It's not just mm. that I can tell them what notes to take out or leave in, you know. So that makes me kind of, you know, I, 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 until I could realize that other people just don't hear like I hear, I think they were just being lazy. If that makes any sense at all. Mm-hmm. It's just like, well, you're not working hard enough. Can't you hear that? We got flat to five, man. You know, and Needless to say, <laughs> you know, I, I have a reputation still in Minneapolis as being, you know, not necessarily the most pleasant person to work with. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a much more pleasant person outside of music than I am in music because, because I, I want the top. I, I want top notch. I, I want to be, you know, bulletproof when it comes to playing music. So. No, I, I mean, you, you know, that's, um, a thing that you know for some of us culturally you always have that um, not not to make you as an older person but there was there was that man that was you know not the drill sergeant but that you know he didn't play no games like yo we doing this for real so tighten up get it together type thing yeah, that's kind of what I'm kind of getting from yes but instead of insulting people I learned <laughs> to just <laughs> tell them thank you and just not use them again oh, you know okay. what I mean gotcha. like, it's, like oh, yeah. what is, why are you going to, you know, drag somebody through all that who you can't work with anyway? Just, you know, just be polite and, and be gracious. They tried. They did what they knew to do. You know, it just wasn't what, what you needed. So I, I learned that from him. Also, you know, <laughs> as, as much of an ego as Prince had, People would still walk in, and you could, you could like even with Stevie Wonder, like it was not he he had the same kind of reverence for Stevie that we did, you know, like uh, he was really uh, there was a not a reverential fear, but it's this thing about like, dude, you did it before I had a chance to do anything, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and um, I think that uh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember where I was going with this, um, oh. Right. We were in rehearsal one day and um, they were shooting some scenes from Grumpy Old Men 2 on the soundstage. I'm sorry, say what, what was that again? The shooting they were what? shooting footage for Grumpy Old, Gr- Grumpier Old Men. Oh, okay. The, like the sequel. I think it was called Grumpier Old Men. Yeah, yeah, it not, was. Not Grumpy <clears throat> Old Men 2. And um, Anne Margaret wanted to meet Prince and she just walked into rehearsal. <laughs> And Prince was playing, and you know, and he looked, he looked like who just walked in my, and he saw it, it was Ann Margaret. It was like, oh, like he kind of, he was really like genuinely like, whoa, it's Ann Margaret. Like he took his guitar <laughs> off of it and went over to shake her hand and was like really, you know, like his Prince was, you know, Prince was Prince, but you know, what did, what did they say? Game recognizes game, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like if you, if you were somebody to him, then you know. He kind of would go into that, that a little bit of that kind of fan mode himself, you know. Hmm. Okay, you just made me think of something too. I, I forgot to ask. You mentioned a movie. Uh, I'll do anything. Oh, tell me your, some of your remember, memories about working you know, working on that project. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you first that we re- literally recorded. Um, almost all that music in one session. Mm. Um, Like what you hear is what we did more or less. Uh, 
she spoke to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the song called? I think it's called The Rest of My Life. There is Lonely. Uh, don't Talk to Strangers. I like all of them. Same day. Uh, wow. Some, something, something about a little pill or something. Oh, be mm, my mirror. Mm-hmm. Same day, we cut all of those because the uh, the director wanted to hear uh, what music Prince had for the film, and then Prince was like, "I need to have all these. I need to record all of these today." And so we knew it was going to be a long one, so we buckled down and we took notes when we needed to take notes, and we just pushed through it. And like two days later, Prince comes back and says, "Apparently." They want the cast to sing these songs. <laughs> and Julie Kavner, who plays the voice of Marge Simpson, yeah. was in the cast. And Prince said, Marge Simpson ain't going to be singing my music. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much it. <laughs> Whatever happened after that was what, however they worked it out. But yeah, Like Nick I mean, Nolte was in that cast too, right? Yeah, Prince didn't want to hear them people singing his music. <laughs> he didn't want to hear Tom Jones singing, singing Kiss. Uh oh. Oh. I asked him. I, I said, I said, uh, did you give him permission to do that? He said, you used to you used to have to have permission, but now you don't. I don't. I I I don't think he particularly was fond of anybody really doing his music, or very few. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what was wrong with the what the with the version I put out? Why you think you gotta you know come behind me and do another one? <laughs> and for the for the listeners who don't know, I'll do anything was it or is a movie, right? It, it actually yeah. came out, but mm-hmm. they that's, they took out the song parts. It was going to be like a, more of a musical, I guess, or something. That's right, because Prince said, mm-hmm. uh, "No, that's all right." <laughs> wow! Did so? Uh, did he think that he was going to be singing the songs in the movie? Is that how they pitched it to him or something? I, I'm not sure. All I know is when we found out Marge Simpson was going to be singing his music, <laughs> he said, uh, "That's okay. I'll uh, you know, I'll pass." Wow, <laughs> I, well, I could see the, them. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say on, on the on the continuing on the music front, uh, <clears throat> the legend is well known that when um, Kevin Smith came to ask Prince to use the most beautiful girl in the world for Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, Prince said, "No, you can't have that, but you can have Jungle Love." Did he get a lot of requests like that to do you know for people to use his film music in films? Um. You know, I could, I, I would imagine, I, I would imagine so, but I, I, I couldn't say for sure. Uh, one of the only situations I remember him telling me about where somebody wanted to use his music and he was like, no, was uh, when Tupac came asking for 777-9311. And, uh, you know, Prince told me, he's like, he's, uh, <laughs> Tupac won, won. Wants the loop, wants the sample seven 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 ninety three eleven, but um, he he said that uh, he's like I don't know I don't think I want my music used that way, you know, and I think he went on to explain something like that also to uh, uh when he did the Chris Rock interview, uh, was saying that you know I, a lot of music I I like but you know I got to be responsible about what happens to my music. You know, some some of that music, some some hip hop was he liked, and some of it he he didn't necessarily care for. I don't I don't know how he felt about Tupac in particular. I'm just saying that a, a lot of people came asking for permission to use stuff, and he that, he often said no. That that's interesting because they did use the music. <laughs> no, they did. That was the, that's he not had, sample. No. Oh, no. they replayed. They replayed it. Really. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know what? Maybe you're right. Yeah, I guess he did. Huh? Uh, I I know I'm right. <laughs> I know. Maybe you're right. <laughs> nigga didn't tell me. I was I was on my I was on my Prince fandom online and trying to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just playing around. But yeah, no, they they he had to hire somebody to 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 re, re, re remake the track. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because there's a couple. Now that you make me think about it, there are a couple of unreleased. Tupac songs where he sampled some Prince stuff. I always wonder. Yeah. Probably didn't got clear. I think one of them he samples uh, If I Was Your Girlfriend from the Sign of the Times movie. Could be. I mean, yeah. obviously, Frey by MC Hammer is the dumb yeah. scribe. Mm-hmm. So Did sometimes. Hammer record there at Paisley Park when you were there? 
I don't know if he recorded, but I do remember one day he walked in with all those dudes, a dude with the hair that looked like a hat. And <laughs> like they all walked in, like 14 of them came walking and checking Paisley Park out in full regalia. Wow. Yeah. Hell, don't, don't hurt him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I didn't, I don't think I spoke to anybody. I was just like, oh, okay, all right. And just cut, you know, cut across, cut through one of the, one of the studios and went somewhere else. Hilarious. Yeah. Who was the, was there one person that you were most surprised to see at Paisley Park? Oh, wow. (laughs) Surprised to see at Paisley Park. Um, I guess sort of, uh, Sting came in there one day. Hmm. Sting came with his with his with his rhythm section. He was on tour, uh, but he needed to record a vocal for uh, his song "Demolition Man." He remade it for the movie "Demolition Man" with Sylvester Stallone and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, they had the, the tapes sent to Paisley. So that he, when he was in town uh, performing, he could come to the studio before or after and just do the vocal. So he came walking in and looking around and what's Sting doing here? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a, a little a, a little weird, but um, you just made me think of another story, though. I, I <laughs> probably the most bizarre sighting for me was REM. Leaving, upset, leaving Uh-oh. the building. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's funny to me, man. Because <laughs> if Prince needed to do something, he didn't really care what he needed to, uh, like how it, what had to happen to, to make it so. And they were, I think they were mixing. I think the record's called "Automatic for the People." Yes. <clears throat> they were yes. mixing that record in Studio A. They bought out like a week or, or something like that. And Prince needed to use the uh, Studio A for something. And um, and basically threw them out. <laughs> wow. They were leaving out the front door cussing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's people's REM. Why, why are they leaving? <laughs> so the Prince needed to use Studio A. That's why. Damn, <laughs> kick rocks. So, you know, I mean, it was meant to be like a, you know, uh, like an actual official, like kind of open for business type studio. But when Prince felt the need to do something, that came first. <laughs> you know. It's my house. I'm kinda. just picturing Michael Stein walking out pissed off and cussing. He didn't say much, but it was those <laughs> other two dudes, uh, Mike Mills and Peter Buck. They were the ones running their mouths. Oh, okay, I can I can see that definitely. Hilarious. Yeah, they, they they're not used to being treated like that. Mm. <laughs> Was there? I'm sure they had to know going in though. Now look, if uh, you were going to be in Studio A at any time, this is his house. You yeah, you know anyone. that wouldn't be a a, a good thing for, to, to get out because then it would discourage people from coming in and spending money. So they probably did not know that that was a an imminent possibility. Oh. Yeah, I'd be hot too. I'd be like, "Well, where, I need my refund ASAP before I walk yeah. out the door." <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how they worked out the money and that, but yeah, they definitely they left and they were upset. Wow. <laughs> Was there any like um, two things? Did you guys ever like play? Did he ever like have you guys come out and play? It's like basically like do a show and it would be just like a handful of people there. And I'm not talking about like it would be just you know, a late night Paisley thing, but where he opened to the public where maybe it was just some private thing or something. There might have just been, only been a handful of people. Oh, got- yeah. I mean, um, usually when, when uh, a couple of times when Lenny Kravitz came out, he, when Lenny was in town playing, he'd come to Paisley after. And uh, those were always kind of small gatherings. And uh, I think maybe also <laughs> the time that... Uh, Terrence Trent Darby came out. Oh, tell me about this, please. I've never heard <laughs> inklings about this <laughs> so many years. Oh, man. I mean, he played some guitar. He played some keys. But the funniest part 
of the whole thing. And Levi was the one who saw it. And he came back and told us, he said, man, Terrence was about to get beat down in the, in the, in the atrium. He said, this big Jamaican dude was talking to his woman. He was, you know, he was laying it out. And like, you don't, you know, just kind of in her face, kind of hollering. And Levi said, Terrence came up and said, hey, brother, you ain't got to talk to the sister like that. You know, like he was trying to be cool. And the, the Jamaican dude turned around and said, I wasn't talking to you, but I can't. Uh oh. <laughs> well, that, was pretty, that was it. On, on the, like, <laughs> he went on his merry way after that. Because this dude was like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was in their G check and people in the Paisley Park. Mm. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, I admire his, you know, his, his adventurous spirit. That, this dude was big, man. Hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't talking to you, but I can't. You want to? You want to talk about this? So now I'm gonna go over here to the wishing well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> wishing well. Not. <laughs> not if you let me stay. If you let me leave. Exactly. <laughs> if you let me leave. Stop. Stop. <laughs> oh man. All right. Uh, man, you got anything else big sex say? <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong, big sexy? What's going on, man? What is- I'm just picturing, you know what? I'm not trying to dog anybody. And again, you know, getting into it with your lady in public, no, that ain't cool. But I'm just picturing Terrence <laughs> walking about this giant man. Hey, man, you know, it's not cool to get into all this. I was not talking to you. But I can. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's it. You can you can see it then. I've, I've told the story correctly. It's like he's still laughing about it. And I can see Terrence Darby getting getting that look of uh, you know Shasha on his face. You know what? They're calling me over here by the wishing well. You guys, good yeah, luck with that. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> run along, now, when you run say along. he was a big, you say he was a big guy. How tall are you, Mike? Me, I'm five eleven. Is that? Well, I'm thinking. Huh? He says, I, I thought you were a big man. Nah, man. I am disappointed. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I'm disappointed, uh, Mike. Yeah, I'm like 5'11". I'm saying this dude was probably like six and a half feet tall. And kind of like... Oh, okay. Six, okay. Like look, I don't want to say he looked like Terry Cruz's body, but like... Oh. oh. This is really a situation. You know, oh. When I say big, I don't mean wide. I mean like muscular Yoked. like... Yeah. Yeah. That, don't test me. Bumble yeah, so I used to be able to I'm look at him and know that's not a situation you want to get into. Yeah, let's walk away from that one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mr. Bland, let me. So I, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna, I'm trying to get at you a little bit. I want, I want to ask you something because I think it was on Facebook. This might have been a while ago, and somehow we was talking about. Uh, damn, now you made me freak my man's name. Uh, my 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 guy from Hawaii. Uh, Bruno Mars. Sorry. Oh, okay. And I think I was joking and saying something like, "Like, would you play in his band? Like, if it was like, yo," and it was like you were kind of saying like you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to play in that. Is that what you remember this? Um, I'm sure that that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just curious. Like, what's what's wrong with Bruno? I mean, and I'm and I'm saying this to say, obviously, you've played in pop group before, right? The Jonas Cats. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure what angle to take right here. <laughs> Trying to be diplomatic, right? You ain't got well, to. You ain't got to be diplomatic now. I mean, I, 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 I listen. I, I've turned down a lot of gigs in, in my day, mm. and I, you know, for me to. I'm kind of at that point in my career where I do what I enjoy, and okay. I don't particularly care for his music. Interesting. Um, I didn't like that performance he did where he was playing "Let's Go Crazy," that guitar solo that was a little out of tune, and you know he could he could have had a, a better sound happening. But I, you know, I just I don't I, I don't I don't like what I've seen him trying to do. Okay, I can take that. I can take that. I, I don't. I, I it's uh, I I don't. I, I guess I've said it. Like I, yeah. I don't really care for it, and and I, if I could, aff- <laughs> if I could afford to to not do it, 
and, and then I won't do it. Is there somebody out there of, of, of these entertainers out here today? And then there are some musicians out here as well. Uh, is there any who, who, who you like? Who you see out there, and you're like, you know what? They doing their thing. I like what they do. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Oh, Mike. sure. Yeah. Where are you going? <laughs> Sorry. No, I heard. We heard the pimp hand come out for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to know what she was going to person or coat. I'm like, where are you going? I, I knew you would let that fly by. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Just <playing. laughs> No, but I was asking, are, are there any um, <laughs> entertainers or Sorry, musicians man. out there that, you, that you, you admire or you like that's current? That I admire or like that's current? Oh, well, yeah, man. I mean, there's a lot of music that I've heard that I, that I like a lot. And even some of that, I don't know if I'd want to get all cozy. Sure. You know, um, I think probably the, the future for me, like once I... Uh, when I do decide to maybe relocate for, for my golden years or for my, for my last professional hurrah, I'll probably end up moving to Nashville. I mean, mm. a lot of, uh, a, a lot of hip hop and uh, a lot of modern music isn't really being driven by real drums anymore, but there's a country music. They, they, they need it. They got to have it. And I feel like there's a whole revenue stream in Nashville that I could be opening up if I just, started going down there and laying the groundwork. You know, I don't know if I'd want to live there forever, but I mm. certainly feel like um, uh, country music is one of the only types of music where you still got to really, you really still got to bring it. Like, you're supposed to sing well. You're supposed to play well. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, all, all that really matters to me. And it's, I, I guess the things that I value about being a musician uh, uh, um, a lot of that is still alive in that market. And again, I'm not the biggest fan of country music, but I know that there's a place for me in it. You know? Okay. There's definitely and, a bag uh, in that. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry? That's great. That is, that's some forward thinking. That's great. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, whereas, as you know, it's like everybody in, 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 I don't want to say black music, but in black music, everybody's, you know, it's there. It's driven by, you know, electronic instruments. Mm. So, I mean, I do some of that also, but, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's the difference between, I don't know what it's the difference. Between. It's, it's the ultimate difference, it's, you know, a, a, a totally organic instrument versus something that's, you know, Totally digital. I mean, I, it's hard to explain the difference if you don't. Do oh, I can explain the difference. Okay. Back in the eighties, <clears throat> in the mid eighties, when I was a roadie, um, Steve Smith, who was a drummer for Journey at the time, oh yeah, uh, started tinkering with the Simmons drum kit, mm -hmm. and it was a big deal at that time. And I hated it, I hated it. And then he went back to you know regular acoustic drums a couple of years later, but. I could not stand that. So, and again, I'm not putting words in your mouth by any stretch, but I can see why, you know, a person who was plays an acoustic instrument like a drum would not like the electronics too much. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying I don't like them. They have their place. It's just um, what I'm best at. I, I can't. I can't show using that medium. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is why I'm, I'm, I've been in Soul Asylum for the last 15 years because uh, it's, it's a stripped down unit. It's basically uh, two guitars, bass and drums. And um, it's, uh, I don't know, it's all natural. It's kind of confrontational music. Like it's fun to play. And um, I guess the other thing is just, um, Working with people who are from where I'm from, we got a shared sort of work ethic. You know what I mean? Like I've worked in L.A. off and on during the course of my life. And um, uh, for me, my experience was that people are really distracted in L.A. Like musicians are distracted. But there's a lot going on. Um, it's... I don't know. They it just where I'm from. You rehearse until it's right. 
and it don't matter what time the clock said. Mm. And in my experience, you know, people, <laughs> I'm not used to having a life and, 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 and having music. Like on that level, like when I, when I enter into a rehearsal phase, you know, we get to go out. That's all that matters to me. And uh, I realize a lot of people don't have the, the luxury or the latitude to approach music that way, but it seems like a lot more people have it here in Minneapolis than in a lot of places in the country. Like where, it, I mean, it might, somebody used to say to me that it was because of the weather. Because once it turns winter here, they ain't nothing to do but work on music. You know? Work on music or make babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but only one of those might bring you some money. That's true. <laughs> oh, we didn't have I don't think we asked about this, and I'm curious about this because I don't know I admit my ignorance. Um Sons of Almighty. Oh wow, you digging that. Yeah, man. Like <laughs> I remember hearing about it. Wow, you're but, asking for a real story, Michael Anthony. Hey man, I'm trying to get you while I can. Um, tell, tell us about Sons of Almighty. How did that come to be? And when I see the name of it, I'm thinking, oh, this is like a gospel group or something. It is. Okay, see. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, where do I even start? Let me tell you something. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to keep going to this territory, but I guess I'll, I'll just tell you a story. Uh, Michael Anthony Dean, that I, I don't know how it's going to affect the listeners because I'm really not trying to paint things in a particular kind of light. But let me just get on with it. Um, we were playing, I believe it was Wembley Arena in probably 95. I guess that was probably uh, the Gold Experience Tour. And uh, we got into P Control. And I took a look around, and I saw within the first few rows, like a lot of young girls, like young women, and uh, this inner dialogue kind of started. And uh, I, from that point, I was actually somewhat conflicted with being where I was at and contributing to what I was contributing to. And um, some just said, is this what you want to be remembered for? And uh, it, I mean, in that moment, the whole thing was just, I don't want to say it was, uh, a, 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 it's not the right characterization to say it was an offense to my spirit, but something in me was uneasy about it. Like, this is not really... I, I've been able to tell myself that basically this is just a job and it's so different than any other job. Like, you know, people would ask me sometimes, uh, like, um, you know, all that, all, all that sex and, you know, all that swearing and all that. It's like, you know, it's, uh, you know, why are you contributing to that, uh, to that environment? Why are you working for him? And I would ask them, I'd say, well, if I worked at Honeywell and I built detonators, should I res feel responsible for the, drums that, the bombs that get dropped on people? Like, I'm a cog in a wheel. I'm just performing a function. And I think I was pretty much able to tell myself that even and believe it for, for some time. But something about that and taking a look around and saying, what, what am I doing? What's, what's happening here? And um, I continued to wrestle with it uh, all the way until when, when, we, were, uh, when, when we were let go. And um, Sons of Almighty was an attempt to say something different, to do something different. Um, and uh, I uh, talked to Tommy and Sonny and uh, my friend Julius Collins, who actually moved to Minneapolis because I asked him to. Him and his wife picked up. <laughs> and moved, he's just, he was a... Uh, great singer that moved to Minneapolis from Atlanta. And um, he sings with Dr. Mambo's Combo. He has on and off over the years. And also was in a band called Greasy Meal from Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. And uh, 
done many things and just a great singer in his own right. Um, it was the four of us and a guitar player named Jeff Lee Johnson. And Jeffrey, I met while I was on tour with Shaka Khan. And uh, he was immediately the, the greatest guitar player I ever heard in my life. And I still say that. Um, he unfortunately he passed away some years ago. But um, so it was the five of us. And um, Sonny and I were writing together. Julius and I were writing together. We, we, were, we were all writing together and we managed to make one record. It took uh, a, a, a couple of years to finish. <laughs> and uh, um, it's forever out there as a testament to, you know, what uh, maybe where I was coming from on a, on a, on a spiritual level. A lot of it just, I mean, I, what I wanted to do was, in a way, something like Grand Central Station did, except I wanted it, you know, to sound a little modern. And um, uh, just like a funky record that just sounded as good as the other records you can get your hands on, you know? And um, I feel like it yielded some interesting things, but mostly it was something I needed to do for me. And my brethren helped me to realize my vision. And um, again, it's I mean, anybody interested in listening to Sons Almighty, they can find us on YouTube. Well, the, the whole record's out there. Was this like a project to sort of cleanse your yeah, spirit? That's a good. That's a good way to put it. Like I had some things I wanted to say and some things I wanted to try, and um, and. When I called asking for help, those are the guys who said yes. Hmm. I mean, it's a it was a band, but I I had to initiate the process. Okay. Yeah. See, there's something a lot of people don't talk about sometimes, but I think I remember hearing uh, I want to say Dez, kind of when he was kind of stepping away, he felt like kind of conflicted by some of the messaging. In some yeah. of the songs, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm always very curious because I'm the first person to say we are influenced by media, whether it's music, movies, for good, bad, or whatever. And I always, I, I used to say that it, if you look at Prince's stuff, I remember when I was younger, you know, my older people, my uncles and my mom, and different things, they would just immediately see Prince and be like, no, you, <laughs> you're not playing that. Not even really if they really knew exactly what he was saying, but they knew enough to know that my young mind didn't need to be hearing that. Well, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's I, I hear you, man. Well, so it's just interesting. When some people we never really touch on that a lot, and I'm not saying this in a negative way to a prince. I'm just keeping it a buck. Like um, some of the messaging, it was out there. You know, it's 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 a. Uh, is a time and place for everything, obviously. But I was curious. It'd be curious, like, for you as a, your person, your own self, to know that you're on stage singing and playing this and you can directly see the effect that it may have on people. Mm -hmm. And you're, like, sort of, like, dealing with the fact that, yeah, I'm contributing to, <laughs> you know, I don't know, what, where is this pushing them? Or, you know, you put energy out there and people, they may not be ready for this or, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's a very interesting thing to hear you say that. I mean, I'm, I, I'm really, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to tell the truth about the situation and, and about my, my personal challenges. But I, I would, I, I think that I, I, I had heard, actually, um, I remember asking Levi, like, um, I said, uh, or I said, like, Prince should make a gospel record. Levi looked at me and said, uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think he should do that because, you know, it's, it, it, he, I seem to imply that it would be, if he did, it would be extremely controversial because, you know, Prince's ways and maybe his beliefs even uh, could, could, could be a little unorthodox. And, you know, a hot button in the United States has always been religion. Mm. So, you know, he thought it might not be such a good idea. You know, I was thinking about that, like, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I could see that. But then you see him do, you know, projects like Rainbow Children. 
and things yeah. that really sort of delve into, you know, his interpretation of, uh, of, of certain things, you know, in terms of religious doctrine and, and yeah, things of that Yeah, he's got nature. his own way of seeing things, yeah. like most people. But if you've been a button pusher, you know, <laughs> <laughs> since 1978, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And it's, you're like, don't do that. I want you to do it. Like, yo, bro, that's your whole... That's been your whole thing. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I mean, where the girls at? Where... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I'm just saying. Again, I'm not trying to lay any kind of judgment out. I'm just saying this was my experience in the situation. And, you know, I, there were times uh, over the years where I was conflicted. I, I, almost, um, I almost left twice. I almost left to go work for David Bowie in 93. Really? Yeah. Whoa. And um, what was the story behind that? <laughs> oh, just that, you know, Prince was starting to say, you know, I don't really want to play so much of my old material. He's playing these hits over and over, boring to me. I want to do something different. I want to do this and do that. And um, the things were just, just took in a direction that I didn't really feel like I wanted to stay for. And we were um, in London. And uh, Prince's UK publicist was co-managing David Bowie at the time. And I just happened to tell the dude, I would love to work for David Bowie. And he's, oh, well, that's what I know him. And uh, he's, he's, he's been, and said, oh, oh it's, that dude's name is Chris Fool. Hi, Chris Fool, if he's, if he's out there. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, so I'm sitting in the hotel room on, on a Sunday where we, got, we had off. And I pick up the phone. The phone rings. I pick up the phone. It's David Bowie on the other end. Wow. And, uh, you know, <laughs> first of all, I was shocked and stunned. And <laughs> I didn't really know what to say. But he, he, but he was really cool, a really nice guy. And, you know, um, to, to, to my disappointment, he was saying the same thing that Prince was saying. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm tired of playing, you know. Uh, space oddity every night. I like. I really want to do something different. Uh, and um, <laughs> I've got the tour coming up with Nine Inch Nails. And I was and thinking in my brain, well, that dog ain't gonna hunt. Like his Trent Reznor's fans are not going to give David Bowie the same kind of respect that they give him. And and worse yet, Nine Inch Nails was going on first. So by the time David mm. Bowie got on, the, the you know it was like half full. People leave it. Mm. You know, and I, I just saw that coming a mile away, and I was like, I don't want to be there for that. And and the money was pretty much the same; it was comparable. I'm like, this is just a lateral move. I'm not doing this. Hmm. So I I didn't. <laughs> it was the other time you said you, you said twice. Oh, it was, you know, it was after after the nude tour. I had heard actually that Stevie Wonder was holding auditions in L.A. and putting a new band together to go out and tour with, and I was like. I, I can see where this is headed. Like, I, I could tell, you know, the good and the bad, you know, uh, what it would be like to stay where, with Prince. And um, I decided that, well, I, I had decided that maybe it was, this was the time for me to go out to L.A. and try to, you know, get my foot in the door and start doing some other things. And, um, I think I had mentioned it to Bobby Z. I saw him out one night. And he said, man, I understand how you feel. It can be rough sometimes working with him, you know. But I'll tell you this. He said, if you were in a, if you were in a war, you wouldn't want anybody else to be your general. Hmm. Prince is, is uh, um, he's, he's always fighting to win. Like, you couldn't have a better person to be leading you, you know? And I listened, I heard what he was saying, and I was, oh, well, you know, and it, it softened me up some, and I, I think it must have just gotten, even Bobby might have mentioned something to Prince, but I ended up on the phone with him saying, you know, well, you know, uh, you know, I, I, are you not, do you, you don't, you don't like playing my music, so on and so forth, and, you know, I mean, you're young, you're, you know, you're, you're a great drummer now, and you, you're young, you're only going to get better. Tell me what I can do. You know, what do you, you know, what are you interested in doing? You know, like he was really intent on, you know, keeping me there to, you know, 
to, to do what I was doing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, he eventually just kind of, you know, he talked me down and I, and I stayed, you know, but there were many times in between where I was spiritually conflicted or felt some kind of way. But I always kind of let this voice inside of me that said, well, you could leave any time. You could go whenever you want. But I didn't. You know what I mean? Like I'd tell mm-hmm. myself that I could go, but I wasn't really ready to take that step. Why not? Um, being, you know, working with one of the world's greatest, you know, all the accolades that came with it, the, you know, uh, plus, I mean, the, 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 the tremendous musicianship and those people were my friends and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. Were the reasons like why young people make the decisions they make, you know, you know, the, the sense of being somebody, you know, but it, it's taken me until, you know, I, I, till, <laughs> till I turned 50 to realize that, you know, none of that, all, all those reasons that I stayed, they, in the long run, they, they don't really mean what you think they mean. Now that's, that's the wisdom talking right there. So experience. Well, I'm just saying, yeah. right. the, the times I had with Prince out of his employ, like with, without being like a hired on, were the best times I ever had. Because you know? mm. we were just, you know, I was coming in to do a job, and it was like, it was minus all the trappings of being involved in, in an inflexible situation. You know? And I, I, I mean, I guess I always kind of, I had a, uh, I, I always had most of myself involved, but I always kept a piece of me for me. Which is why I, the whole time I was playing with Prince, I was still playing downtown, still playing at Bunkers, playing with Dr. Mambo's Combo. And he asked me one day early on at, uh, after I, when I, uh, I had been working with him for, working for him for a year and a half so, and I was leaving Paisley to go downtown. And he said, why are you still playing with those people down there? Like, why do you, you know, what's down there for you? And I told him, I said, <laughs> All day long, you know, I'm out here, and and I play what you say. When I go downtown, I play what I say. Mm. You know, and he looked at me and said, I, like, he really got it. Like, I need a place where I can be free to express myself musically how I want, like, a, away from, you know, whatever perceived scrutiny I thought I may have been or or not. You know, but I just needed a place to clear my head after being out there for 12 hours and basically playing, <laughs> as Simon says, for a living, you know. <laughs> wow. And, and he got that, you know. All right. Man, is there anything else we want to cover? Is that, 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 that was a great way to end it as well, but. <clears throat> well, you know, I got I two mean, little dinky things. Please go ahead. Please. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. One, did you get a chance or opportunity to listen or watch him with Third Eye Girl? And what did you think about that? And the the other one is be looking for me on March eighth in San Francisco at Slim's. You right? coming to that show? I'm coming to check you out. Okay. All right, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm preparing for that then. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I mean. Most of the music that came out after, uh, after my uh, my tenure, my full run with Prince, like the eighty nine to ninety six, I always waited for a long time after to listen because I didn't want um, my opinion to be swayed by what the fans said or what anybody said. Really, it's, I like to listen to that music outside of the context of when it's released. Because I feel like I can get a better read, so I really I waited for everything, um, and I gotta say I probably waited until after he died to seriously listen to the Third Eye Girl, and I actually thought they were pretty good. I, you know, I mean, I, it's a, a lot of people I knew didn't particularly care for what that was, but um. Uh, and me look looking at it now, or looking at it whatever it was that I started looking at it, I'm like, they can play, you know. And that's the thing I was trying to explain um, in part one is that what 
people don't understand is how good you got to be <laughs> to work with somebody who's great. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got to be great to work with great people. You know what I mean? And have it work. You know, have right. it make sense. Mm -hmm. And and same thing with them. They had to be able to uh, coalesce <laughs> the vapor of, you know, the intent behind his music. They had to be saying something for him to be into them. Like something that he could latch on to. There had to be an understanding and that they're reaching for the same thing. And that was the other thing I was trying to explain is your working attitude is everything. Being open-minded is everything. You know, everybody's got, a, you know, certain chops and everybody leaves something to be, be desired. Some, everybody's got, you know, strong suits and, and uh, uh, you know, and things they need to work on. So you can't really judge any of those women by, you, uh, it's what, <laughs> their relationship is important, but their understanding of where he's trying to go is what got them where they were at. Like he felt some kind of, synergy or commonality like they understood something you know what i mean i see what you're saying yeah okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know if you agree but you see what i'm saying no, i mean i have and listen I, I don't play so i can't say nothing but oh man I mean, uh, at, at xl uh, ida was killing it man uh, ida ida nielsen she doing, was killing it doing her thing. she held her own against mono neon Sonny and Goucher. And let me tell you who I really like, man. A big shout out <laughs> to, um, uh, hold on. No, nah, I can't remember his name. I've been my mind as much, man. <laughs> what is his name? Uh, oh. Uh, uh, What's he playing? What's he oh, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, my man, Josh. Josh Dunham. Oh, okay. Mm. Josh <clears throat> Dunham is one of my favorite bass players, man. He has got... I mean, the, uh, actually, when he first joined Prince's band, Prince had come down to Bunkers. Like he, he, he used to come down to the club all the time to listen to us. And I went down to talk to him. He said, you're going you to like my new bass player, man. His name is Josh. He said, he's, uh, he's young, but he plays old. He plays all the right notes. He don't, make no, you know, he don't play no bad notes. He's funky, man. Wait till you hear him. And sure enough, when I heard Josh, I was like, ooh, he's... He's got his like one foot in the contemporary world, but his soul, like his funk is old funk. <laughs> like he's got something, something, there's just something about it. It's like, I, I, it's really fun to play with him. He's got great time, great taste. His, his hone is happening. And, and he's a really nice guy on top of all that, you know? So. Okay. Um, I, actually, I got two, two more here, two for myself. Sure. Uh, this might be a hard one for you. I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, assemble your all-star Prince band with past band, band members. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, yes, you can. And there's no shade. The pick who you pick. This is who you pick. You say what you say. I mean, it's... Everybody has something. They had something else to offer. Stop it! Stop. It's the truth. <laughs> I I know that, but I'm, we're asking you to pick though. So we got all that out the way. Go ahead and pick your members, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're killing me. <laughs> uh, oh, baby. You know what? Let me go with the people. Let's go with the people that I never got a chance to play with. I'll put those people together. Here you go. Perfect. That's perfect. That's okay. Fair. Now we need some names. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I definitely always wanted to work with Wendy and Lisa. Okay. I always wanted to work with. Them. Um, I would say, um, on the opposite side of that, uh, Rhonda Smith. Mm. I've I've gotten a chance to work with her, but I didn't get to in that context. Like she actually has uh, given me uh, a, a little dap over the years. I've done some recording sessions in LA that were real good sessions where, where she, they asked her, 
who you want to play drums? And she would recommend me, and I'd be out there, <laughs> you know, happy as a possum eating grapes, man, out there <laughs> like, making that, making that, that, like that, that big session money. Nice. Like she's she's really been good to me, considering we don't know each other that well. Mm-hmm. But, All right. Okay. You know, uh, Cat Dyson. I wish I would have been in with Cat. Mm. You know, um, she's still somebody I, I would like to like like to play with. Um, Oh, who else, man? Really? You know, I mean, I've, I've had a chance to work with Des, so I've, <laughs> you know, I, I, I like Des. I, I, I dig his style. He, he's still got it. He still plays great. Uh, I, this is not really putting together a band, is it, Michael? Because <laughs> you, you, you're playing around. You, I'm you playing try, around. You're trying to be diplomatic. It's, <laughs> it's, not, it's like saying, man, you like, uh, you know, he far better than Kit Kat. No, nah, we or just you just you you have to make a Maybe choice. Top five candy bar. You just got to make a choice. Ain't? There's no shade in who you pick. This is this is who I'm picking. Get out your feelings. This is what it is. How about this? How about this? You can add the caveat that this list could change tomorrow. You know, because people ask me all the time what my favorite LP is. I'll say, like today, it's what's going on by Marvin Gaye. But tomorrow, you can ask me, it could be something else. I, I tell you what, man. I mean, really, <laughs> I, to be perfectly honest, I really think that if you're talking about musicianship and tightness, uh, that first incarnation of the MPG was it. Okay. That was my dream band. Because Levi was vicious on bass during the nude tour, but he got nastier when he went to guitar. And Sonny came in, man. I mean, that was, that band was like, uh, it was like the death grip, man. I, I, I just, no other musical experience like it in my life. I, I would, I would probably rather play with Sonny and Levi uh, and Miko if he wanted to come on into it. Mm. Man, I love the way Miko played. He was so tight. Eric Leeds, yes. baddest man walking. Yes. Bliss, those two together, absolutely. I did a gig with them, uh, with P Funk at the Glam Slam. Uh, Tony Thomas got double booked. I think he he was a, a drummer from uh, DC, who I think he was also playing with Trouble Funk or somebody like that. But he was also playing with George, and he got double booked. And they were coming to Minneapolis to play, and they uh, FedEx me a cassette to, to listen to, and and Eric and Bliss. We're playing horns that night. Wow. And, uh, oh, man, I didn't know Eric can do anything. Eric Leeds can do anything, man. Yeah, he's he, he got so much, uh, I mean, he's got so much, he's familiar with everything, with all that funk. He just put, his, put the horn up to face, and it happened. <laughs> he, they were playing stuff that, that was blowing uh, George and Gary Scheider's mind. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> oh, you all playing that? <laughs> <laughs> they turn around and just point at him. <laughs> oh, play that again, Eric. And they, they hit it again, man. It was <laughs> that gig was crazy. Uh, I mean, what can I say, man? Rosie, every, every time, every time she, every time we played together, it was like church, man. You know, mm. I mean, really, that that group, that group of group of cats, where we were at, those were the, the those were really. Um, Really good days. Tony, Damon, and Kirk, all of us together, you know, uh, and most of us ain't never been nowhere, you know. <laughs> and, you know, Levi kind of being, you know, being the MD and kind of the, you know, like the, not overseer, but I mean, like really, like, you know, he, he really looked out for everybody. Right. The big brother. You know? of yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like we really had it. We came into our own. I didn't feel like I was playing in a cover band anymore. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, up until that point, everything I was playing was just whatever Sheila or Bobby played with my own twist to it, mm. you know. But once we got hits of our own, on, you, know, under our, uh, you know, under our belt, and I'm coming home at 2.30 in the morning, turning on MTV and cream, the video's on, and I'm, you know, <laughs> like that, that, that band, that phenomenon, I, uh, nothing can be taken away from it for me. Wow, okay. I'm, I'm deviating for a quick second, but you mentioned a video... Were you in that video for uh, 
Does I want to melt with you? I, I don't. <laughs> that was it was a no, that was a, that was a, other people. <laughs> <laughs> that was other people. <laughs> yeah, that was a wild video. <laughs> yeah, that's a wild video. You ever seen the uh, what was it? Is that Playboy or something the, like that? It was there was a video for like the porno mix of My Name Is Prince. Whoa! Yeah, I it's never just heard a bunch of, of naked women in it. You never seen this? No, I ain't seen that. I've one. seen that actually. <laughs> Interesting. We were, I think they did it on Playboy or something. The yes, Playboy they did. After Dark or something. And we were just at the club. I will never forget this. We were all at the club and slam slam, and it came on, and um, I was like, "What is this? <laughs> I've never seen this before in my life." But <laughs> when did they shoot this? Where was I at? <laughs> <laughs> Wow. See, the original Ratchet. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> so, when that happened, who did it, and, and what, or where. Mm, mm, uh, mm, but uh, what were we talking about? I'm sorry. Are we, I no, I, I threw that in there just. <laughs> <laughs> you done messed up my mind, man. Um, so the second, uh, the, the second, well, we were talking about the bands. Dude. You're, 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 oh, right. So you, I, I can change the thing, man. I went into it with the crew that I was supposed to go in with. And I would I wouldn't have changed one member. All right, All right. I can do baddest it. Baddest in the land, that I, group, the baddest. I dig it. I always remember you guys. There was this another was a bootleg of one of your rehearsals, and it was just you guys. It was the band Prince wasn't even there. I always oh. remember where you guys did. Um, you guys said, "Hold your hands in the air." I told you. Dun, dun, oh, what wow. were we going to skin uh, tight and all that? Skin tight, yeah. That was, it was cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we yeah. did. Um, uh, dead on it, and yep. uh, there was a whole set we were playing kind of by ourselves. Yeah, that was yeah. live, man. That was live. Well, yeah. thanks. I mean, that was a lot of that was Levi. Like, let's go now. Well, wait a minute. Let's do this now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was cold. Um, the other question is, um, there are all of these uh, special edition releases they've been doing. You know, the Purple Rain, and recently 1999, mm -hmm. and of course they had the originals. Uh, release as well, and I'm sure they're going to have a lot more. I, you, as being someone who has recorded with Prince and worked with him, I'm curious, in your opinion, um, would you, would Prince have would wanted his uh, unreleased or sometimes demo tracks released? Do you think he would have been cool with that? Um, I guess my personal opinion is maybe not not, I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have wanted that. Um, I don't know why that's just the feeling I get just from him. Like, I, I mean, a lot of what you'll find in the vault are early versions of songs that you've come to know. Um, you know, quite often he would do one version and maybe he didn't like how it turned out. He tried a different way. You know, um, somebody recently uh, played me a version of When Dubs Cry that had like bass in it, two like distorted guitar parts, mm -hmm. and like all this all this music going on that that I that I never heard before in that song. And I gotta say, it sounded like a mess to me. Mm -hmm. Like Prince knew what he was doing when he started pressing those buttons <laughs> across the console. So he got it down to just the bare essence, just the bare, just the bare necessities happened on, on the Dust I remember him saying to me when he heard it on the radio, it was like between like some Phil Collins song and some, I don't know, maybe some Madonna song that was on the radio. The Dust Cry came on in the middle of these two songs and he was convinced that he had made a mistake. It sounded bare boned and, um, and, uh, Dry, like they were using a lot of reverb in the eighties. The Prince never, he never followed everybody else's conventions anyway. And but he said he thought he had made a mistake with the Doug Cry. He also told me that he thought Kiss was too weird to be a single. Like he just kind of put it out because he wanted to, but it turned out to be his second number one. Mm. Um, so I also do remember him saying, <laughs> like. People think that, you know, he, he said, I have no idea what my fans want from me, musically. 
It's like, I, you know, I can guess. I kind of just do what I do, but I don't really know what they want to hear. And as far as a hit, I, you know, who can tell? He told me that, <laughs> he said, I got an advanced copy of Control by Janet Jackson. By Terry, you know, Terry and Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Somebody sent one over. He said, he, he listened to it. And uh, he didn't think he heard one single on the record. He said, I threw that CD in the garbage. Wow. And he said, every time I heard a song off that record, I'd hear the sound of that CD hitting the side of the tin can. <laughs> every, 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 time, every time he heard one of those songs, it was like a reminder that like, you were dead wrong. That's crazy. And y'all performed yeah. her songs in the new tour. Uh, when, what, when, would that be done when we like lately? Uh, what have you done for me lately? Yeah. Uh, Rosie would say it. Yeah. He was talking about who wrote that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, he thinks that, that he stole, stole that from him or something? I don't know that he thought that, but uh, uh, I, I'm not sure what he meant by that, to be honest. <laughs> I, I was just trying to keep time and not get yelled at, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna drag you into the beef. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not. I didn't, it, it didn't have any bearing on whether I had to play it or not, so I didn't bother. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Okay, I'm doing that. All right. And I just stay right there. <laughs> Keep it steady. Wow. Okay. Um, so man. let me take this opportunity before yes. you cut me off, Michael Anthony Dean. Man, I get in trouble. Oh. I feel like I'm in oh. trouble every time you say that. Like, hey. <laughs> Soul Asylum, my band, yes. has a new record coming out in April. Okay. It's called Hurry Up and Wait. It's going to be on the, uh, I think that this label is called uh, uh, Elon Blue. The label out of Los Angeles. They got an office over on Wilshire. Uh, and they're like old school type of, you know, uh, rock and roll uh, a label type cats. Like they, you know, we finally found a label that I, I think understands us. And uh, they've shown nothing but love and support. And we're going to, uh, we're also going on tour in February. That's why Big Sexy is going to see me. Oh, nice. On uh, March 8th, you said? March 8th, yes. Yeah. We're going to be on the road from about February 11th or so until like, I think we end the run at South by Southwest on like the 19th of March. Oh, nice. And there's a possibility, possibility of going to uh, Canada in April. It's not set yet, but. They're trying to work things out right now. But also, we single out right now called Dead Letter. So Dead Letter. Go out there, take a look for it. It's, it's out there somewhere. It, where, what, where fine fine music products are sold, or, I, I suppose. Or streamed. Huh? <laughs> yeah, or streamed, yeah, that's right. But I just wanted to yeah, get, oh, get for a little sure, down. Man. Yeah, yeah. for my cat, man. I'm 15 years in. Me and Dave Perr, we like brothers now, you know? Nice. So we what, fight the good fight still, man. When does the album come out again? Uh, it's, well, the exact release date hasn't hasn't uh, oh, okay. been set. But, but the single's I've been out. told it's going to be in April. The single's out. Single's out. Soul Asylum. Yeah. That's right. Minnesota Zone. Yes, sir. How, how long has Soul Asylum been around? Since 1981, I want to say. Damn. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's been a long time. I mean, Runaway Train and all that was happened in like 92. 91, 92. And, uh, you know, after all those years of just like traveling in a van and sleeping on people's floors and <laughs> all that, like Soul Asylum really, they really, you know, paid their dues, you know? Okay. And uh, what's fun for me is that I, I always make, make the joke that since I've played for Soul Asylum now is like, I mean, you know, we, get, we, we tour proper. We got a nice bus and everything, but I mean, you know, I, I started at the top with Prince. I came out of college and it was, you know, just, the, you know, I, the upper crust. All, and we got had the best of everything. So I, sometimes I'm on the tour bus with Soul Asylum going, this is the part that I miss. So I guess I'm making up for it now, you know. <laughs> stopping, stopping at the truck stops and, yeah. you know, eating them, uh, you know, turkey and cheese joints. And, you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drinking Faygo great. Hilarious. <laughs> All of that. That's so the best part back that. in the it's, day. Yeah, hey, it's, uh, you know, it's, I, I, I wouldn't still be in it if I didn't really love what I'm doing with, 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 with the group and, and love, love yeah. what we're doing. That's, you know, a, that's just, a blessing, man. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's just, mm -hmm. I guess ultimately, you know, uh, I've, it, all roads have always sort of led back home. I mean, I've worked with Maxwell for a while, but 
you know, it's, it's I, the musicians that I identify with are from where I'm from. Really, those people were great, but they just different ways and means all over, you know. Chaka's mm-hmm. band, those people were incredible. Uh, I mean, I had a great time, you know, but, but when I'm in the presence of other cats who grew up under the same circumstances around the same time, it's just something else happens to me, you know. Man, that's, that's awesome. And so shout out to Soul Asylum. Dead Letter? That's right. Is that what it's called? Dead Letter. Dead Letter is out. Go get it. Go get it. <laughs> get that. Cop that. As uh-huh. they say. Well, uh, oh, and also, because uh, we on the lookout, we can't wait for Tough Love. Oh, yeah. Podcast. You know, somebody, <laughs> I see um, somebody put that in the thing in the, in the comments. Yeah, well, Gregory Bell was like, Tough Love, huh? That's what you're going to run with? <laughs> I'm like, man, I tried to, and I explained to him that it's, it, the title has more to do with uh, the basic idea for the for the podcast is to offer advice to musicians who are looking to you know to, to get their game up. You know, it's going to be a, a lot about the sure industrial use of the instrument, how you how you handle a situation. You know, I give a lot of advice to to younger cats, and um, and I think it's I think I give sound advice to cats who want to sustain uh, s- sustain themselves in this business and. You know, try to try to do it the right way. You know, all right, yeah, man. And often, you know, I was telling them, you know, the reason it's called tough love is because the truth hurts sometimes. And you know, in in music, um, a lot of times people put discipline last. Mm. You know, so that's in everything for a lot of things. Okay, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know your life. I don't. <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying. You know. <laughs> I don't know what it's like to to to, to you know. To hold down an office job or anything, really. This is all I've ever done. But I know that in in, in music, uh, it's a lot of fun to play music. But and uh, and everybody, we don't always have the same reasons for doing it. A lot of people get into it, get into music for uh, you know for for the women, the, the drugs, the, the you know the free drugs and alcohol and. You know, some just, you know, enjoy playing. But, like, if you really want to come up without that discipline, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's going to be hard. Like, you've got to realize that you can't play everything, you know, that impresses your friends when you're behind a singer who's trying to, you know, sing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You be back there sounding like tennis shoes in the dryer, and you're distracting. You distract them from what's supposed to be the focal point of that. And, you know, learning how to, how to listen it, and, and I will. I'll, I'll, yeah, you were. You were actually right. Learning how to listen is a uh, is a lost art. <laughs> people don't know how to listen, hmm. or people are not interested in listening. Mm-hmm. You know. But as a as a musician, that's that's the important part of the battle. It's what you don't play. You know, you got to be more interested in what your neighbors play. And in a lot of that, I learned from out there being out there with Prince. You know, you always say, you know, put your hands down, man. You know, fi- figure out, figure things out for yourself. You know, if you can find the city, then you can find the street. <laughs> you know, so I, I you know, I actually, he uh, imbued me with a lot of wisdom. And uh, I've been sharing it, you know, in, you know, in, in, at restaurant tables and in recording <laughs> sessions and whatnot all these years. And I think it's just time for me to sort of. Uh, take it a little more seriously and make myself and and the information that I've learned uh, accessible. Yeah, you sharing some good game yeah, as well. Trying to, I mean, if you yeah, want to hear it, but it, you know, but I'll, you know, I'm I'm willing to talk about anything, but uh, it's always going to be truthful, and I think I've proven that on my dry run with the juice, <laughs> the juice. <with> Michael B. <laughs> And feature in big sexy. I think I've proven that I'm, I'm going to tell you what it is, and you'll have to figure out what you want to do about it after. But I, you know, I, I think for better or for worse, I'm, I'm known infamously as as a straight talker. So well, I think I think it'd be good, man, because you know, there's you know, everything is so niche today, and there are the musicians that are going to be out there that are going to be searching for something like that, and they'll be like, oh, Michael Bland, okay, I, I know his pedigree. Oh, he's He's dropping some good game. Yeah, let me 
this is for me. I, I'm locked in. So you're going to find there's some people that's going to be locked in with you and like really want to hear that. Because to me, like a, to be a drummer, you got to be super disciplined. I don't know how you do it because I listen to music. I want to act a fool. I don't know how you can just stay. You have to stay locked in. The <laughs> beat, and then you are the beat. So you can't just go off. You got to stay right in that pocket. You're the backbone. Uh, I, I gotta keep the dance floor moving, man. Yeah, that's, that's the yeah. hard thing. I can't even imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's like a lot of other things, and I don't want to <laughs> stop it. <laughs> I don't want to get into it, but you know, you you you, you gotta you gotta play your role. You gotta be right. where you need to be for the ratification of others. <laughs> so that go. takes concentration <laughs> and 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 discipline. You gotta you, know, <laughs> you gotta stay focused. <laughs> Focus. You got to stay focused. You don't, you know, it's, you got to stay in control. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. everybody gets upset. <laughs> well, <and. laughs> what you doing, man? You might get yours, but she might not. Well, yeah, ex- that's what I'm saying. You can't be greedy. You have to share yourself with the situation. For sure. Yes. For sure. Or, or nothing happens. But you, the part of yourself that you need to share has got to be the part that's that's reliable that's supportive mm. you know that's what uh dave perna said he said you know what it's like playing with you man it's like sitting on a memory foam couch <laughs> he's like it's just the best possible feeling i feel like you're just giving me a hug the whole time we're playing <laughs> nice i said that's what it's supposed to feel it's supposed to feel like love dave that's what it is you should feel like i'm concerned for how things are going for you with this music like i got your back man Man, you know That's what, you, what it is. Now that you just said that, I got another title for you. If you want to, if if tough love don't work, I, I'm open. I'm open. Uh, drum stroke. Drum stroke. <laughs> really? It's about time to wrap it up. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> we have reached the apex. Yeah, we reached the summit. We've reached the summit. Yes, we. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, uh, Michael, man, first of all, this is the first time we've ever done a, a two part uh, episode podcast like this. Uh, so I really appreciate you, man, taking the time like to listen, even share with us. man. For real. You want to do a part three before the year's up? I'm down, man. Man. If you want. Be careful what you, you ask for. With me. No, I'm listen. Yeah, be careful I, I tell you me. this. <laughs> I, I, I would love to, but. I'm going to say this now. We're not going to be talking strictly about some print stuff. We might delve into some like current affairs and, and some more cultural topical topics if you game for that. Oh, yeah. We didn't even talk about Lizzo. We, I, see? <laughs> How much time we got? Uh, we didn't even get into that. Listen. Listen. Oh, you didn't open up the can now. Well, <laughs> now that you brought this up, what, so what's your thoughts on that? That on on, on Lizzo now, and now is Lizzo from your area? No, Lizzo, I believe, is from Houston. Okay. okay, but she came to Minneapolis for a few years and got got things jump started for herself. Right, and um, she was a backup singer for a cat named Harmar Superstar, who I also worked with a little bit. Oh. Me and Sonny did a gig with him on a, at a street festival. Here in Minneapolis, of the the Pizza Luce Block Festival, me and Son's up there playing with that dude. He's crazy, man. I love him to death. Okay. His name is Harmar Superstar. His uh, government name is Sean Tillman. He's Dang. from Owatonna, Minnesota, and great singer, great dancer, and uh, nicest guy you ever want to meet. Really. Mm. And um, okay. he's just successful in his own right. She was singing stuff with him, and then she jumped off that and got on her thing. So, okay. Did you do a little thing with Prince too for a second? Uh, I think that what what I saw her say was that she did a session for Prince, but he wasn't there. Oh, interesting. Like she was in some kind of a group that was recording at Paisley. I think they met sometime after that. They call um, them Curly Fries. I don't know if that was their real name. That's uh, what that was that they, Isn't that what it says on the album? Is it Curly Fries? I, I know. Curly, I didn't know she was part of Curly Fries. Yeah, they're gonna crucify me in the comments if I'm wrong, but but she's on the what's the song? Boy Trouble, right? Uh, okay, the Prince Mike, song. Yeah, I don't I, know I'm about not, that one, Mike. I'm not I could have swear. I I, see, <laughs> y'all can. I'll take the L. But anyway, go ahead, Mike. I'm, I'm, no, I'm just saying I don't. I don't know that much about it. I haven't met her. I've I've <laughs> I've only uh, stopped her um, Twitter page a little bit. 
but um, she seems to be, uh, uh, from what I can tell, a genuine person. I just don't. Uh, and one other thing people need to know about when Prince had his, uh, you know, his outfit on, there was actually a very thin mesh material where the buttocks were at. The buttocks. <laughs> like he was not just. He wasn't fully. I, I he wasn't he wouldn't let it fly. That, he wasn't like totally bare back there. <laughs> There was there was like a uh, opaque type material there, but uh, I don't think you can do that on TV. Or you're supposed to. Well, and I guess she that's was, all I'll say about that. <laughs> well, uh, and, and also I'll go back. Yeah, she was on the song "Boy Trouble" on the Plectrum Electrum album. Okay, the Prince. So yeah, she was on the Third Eye Girl. That's album. not what I've gotten to yet. I'm still at uh, oh, okay. at Minneapolis Sound. I think that's the last uh, one I listened to. Gotcha. Of the newer ones. Well, you know, I, I say about this whole thing, and I've said this on the show before, but to me, I, I got to salute her success. Let me be very clear. Like, yeah, you can't, you can't argue with that. Yeah, the the, the train is running. Yeah, she's, she's out there, clicked in, uh, and all that good stuff. I'm just saying, I'm looking at it more in a sense of where I would be like, yo, sis, you don't have to, but you don't, you don't got to do all that. You, they already got you. You out there, you're a star. You don't need to do this. You know, that's why I would rather have like, if, if maybe like like a you know I'm just saying like a, a Mary J or a Beyonce some of these sisters that's in the game established could be like yo we see you you you're the next one you blown up but sis you don't even you don't need to do this this ain't the move you don't need to do yeah, all that I, you know uh, unfortunately we live in an age where all press is good press or at least that's what people think so you know I think that uh. I, I think that um, wow. <laughs> you looking yeah, at I'm, something? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not getting to it. I, I just yeah, you're right, man. But it's uh, somebody should have told her. But I'm sure she didn't really think it was that big of a deal. Or you know what? I actually don't know what she thought. Let me just say that. But I mean, I don't think that uh, there's. I'm, I'm on the cover saying something that might make some people mad, man. I can That's see all it. right. Uh, we're living in this age where we're living in the, in the age of young women, like female empowerment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there's always for a while when there's a shift, people that can do stuff, you know, they go test the water. They, they're going to test their power. They're going to test their influence. And I think she she did something that a, a lot of young people in the business do. Um, I think that she, you know, didn't think it was going to be either that big of a deal or that there wasn't going to be all this negative backlash. You know? And it's hard to tell young women today that just because you can do it doesn't mean it's to be done. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's a, uh, that's, I guess that's all I, I got to say about it. It's not just, I'm not even singling her out. I think it's just, she's a product of the, the current movement. Really. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to begrudge her the latitude to make mistakes. And, you know, I guess what I'd like to know is whether or not she feels like, what she feels like about it now. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't even, I mean, I saw on YouTube that she was like shouting out to all the people for the love and so on and so forth. But I really feel like looking in her face, she got her feelings hurt. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. She kind of started I, crying, I, crying and then I think it's toward the end or something like that. I kind of saw Yeah, that. I, you know, I mm -hmm. feel like she tried to put on a brave face, but, you know, I, I don't know. Man. She'll, she'll, I'm, she'll learn something from it. You know, and I guess that's what's really important. I'm just hoping that she doesn't feel like she's got to resort to the same kind of thing that just happened, you know, to keep all eyes on her. She doesn't have to. She got where she can go without it. Yeah. You know, so we, I don't know if it was just an oversight or, this, you know, just, I don't know, man. It's, it's, just, it's the my, power. my bottom line is just, yeah, just be, you know, let it know that whatever you do on you know, <laughs> television is going to follow you forever. 
<laughs> Be careful what you do, young ladies. Uh, and, and men, you know, it's the power of the clout, man. We live in a world right now where that 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 clout is so strong, uh, in that they get the likes and you get that attention, yeah. uh-huh. and it can sometimes Instagram can get the best of you. Whatnot, I don't even understand that. I don't have Instagram. I'm like, you mean to tell me there's just women on Instagram just? It's, it's, it's a come up. It's a new come it's up. A come up. It's it, okay. It, it, it has replaced the magazine. You know, there used to be the, the men magazine at the store, you know, the store to have the girl. So now, so on one hand, I salute because the, the women or dudes have taken the power away from the magazine, the companies where they got to get an opportunity. They can just do it themselves. Like, so there's no gatekeeper I mean, for that. I, I, hold I, on, hold on, hold on. No, I almost it. said this. I'm, and I, I'm, I'm going to say, why but you got to get black tail? Ha! Why you got black tail out of business, man? What's your problem? Nothing against it. I'm, I have nothing. I, don't I just I couldn't let that go by. <laughs> well, see, and it and it has taken the the girls who might not have gotten in that, or it was you had to go through these people to get in, and who knows what they had to get to do to get through that. Now they can do it themselves. So I do salute that part of it. Uh, the thing is, just you know, there's a time and place for everything. So yeah, if you're your Instagram and you want to show your stuff, that's your page. You, you're fine. But when yeah, you again, go into I'm, the game or some yeah, public thing, uh-huh. you, you're stepping outside of the a time and place for everything. And so you got caught up in it. And when you get caught up in it, that's what happens with the Lizzo thing, right? That Because it would be no... She was already doing little nude shots online and stuff. That's cool. It's your page. But when you step out into the public arena at some sort of, you know, the, a game like that, then you're going to be scrutinized because that probably ain't the time and the place. And secondly, this is not a fair wor- world. So when people say, oh, you fat shaming... Is- you shouldn't do that, but this is the world, and the world ain't playing by making you feel good, you know, methods of, of way. So people are going to say what they say, and that's the way the world is, no matter if it's the way your hair looks, your skin, you know, it's not a fair world. You can't expect that people ain't going to say what they're going to say. You have to understand this is where we at, and when you go out there on a basketball game with your ass out, guarantee you somebody going to say something and maybe something you don't like but when you choose to step into that arena then you have to choose to want to accept the good and the bad of that you can't cry when you get that attention i couldn't have said it better so, but let me go back and say that yes, sir. uh you know um <laughs> you were right to call me on that i i got a tendency to look at uh I, to to examine in a different way young women's conduct because I generally don't have a high opinion of young men. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of them are just, I, I, I don't even consider them in the equation because I can't relate to what they like, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm just I, saying I apologize for, oh, <laughs> I wasn't yeah. trying to keep it one side of what we were talking oh, about. Oh, no, no, I didn't even, I didn't even say it that so way. Somebody's going to be, well, what about men? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> online just <laughs> accused me of being a, um, uh, uh, a member of the o- oppressive, uh, what was it? She called me. I was a. Uh, oh, I was a a a a, 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 a something oppressor. I can't remember now. Just oh, being Lord. a black man and so on. So we were, we were talking about. Um, uh, I can't even remember that. Never mind. You said the black it, man is the oppressor just, now. It's just oh, she she hit me with it, and I'm like, oh, okay, hilarious. All right, I'm, and I and I uh, private message the dude who's. Read it was, and I said, "What? I'm, I'm just going to let her live, man. <laughs> I, I, I feel like she's really upset about something else, so I'm going to leave it alone, man. Because I, I, you know, you got to decide who you who you're going to war with, right? Which, right. You know? And also, you know what? I'm not beyond correction. I, I, I mean, I wish she would have spent more time explaining how so, but you know, instead of that, I just, I just let it go. I'm like, you know what? I don't know everything, and you know, it's. We're living in a age where people get offended real quick. Yeah. They, like, you don't, you know, they, how dare you? I don't know, wait a minute. That just is a, it, take a second to correct or enlighten me. I'm not stupid. I might be ignorant. <laughs> but but take take the time. You know, it matters to you. But she was, I think she was kind of convinced that I was just uh, another of a certain kind of uh of men. 
So it wasn't I, that I, whole I, toxic masculinity I, thing, was it? Oh no, please. I, I don't think so. Okay. I think it was really just somebody who uh she just I, I don't know. I just whatever I said uh made her choose to pigeonhole me. That's all right. Mm. I mean, this is not somebody I know, and I was on somebody else's uh, thread anyway. I don't really care. It was just like, wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, who am I oppressing? I don't, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> it, it probably had something to do with what we were talking about, but I, I just, I couldn't, I considered myself to be, you know, uh, fairly smart, and, and but I couldn't put those two together. Mm. That doesn't mean she was wrong. It just means I didn't get it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I, I only put so much uh, attention and care when I'm talking online. If I don't actually know your real name or know you, I don't let it bother me because I don't know. I, I don't know you. Like I, I don't know who I'm talking to. You know, seven 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 princess or whatever. I, uh-huh. I can't. I can't. I'm not. I can't take it serious. I'm just like, oh, cool. But I, 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 oh, well, well, hey. Anyway, it's a shout out to Rashida Coleman. Since we're on Rashida Coleman, Rashida, Rashida, I was on your page saying something, and Rashida got upset. I've seen that name out there, and the top uh-huh. of my mind, I don't know. I can't. Replace she'll, it. She'll, she'll, you'll be hearing from her shortly. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> don't spend too much energy on it, Rashida, because I'm telling you right now, I, I, you were on there. You 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 came to my defense, and I just I uh, it was another one. It's like. I won't let that that soul sister live. I'm gonna let her live. You know, I vaguely remember you saying this. Now that you say that, I don't uh-huh. remember what it was about. She, she wasn't ready for something I had to say, and that's all right. It's okay. It'll be all right. <laughs> well, cool, man. I mean, let's wrap this thing because we'll get caught up and yeah, go. I know, go man. We keep <laughs> shucking and jiving like this till <laughs> oh, wait, wait. midnight your time, and that'd be two o'clock my time. I can't do it. That's right. right. That's right. It's pretty late for you. <laughs> well, listen. Uh, okay. I, I, I appreciate you. We're gonna do another one. We'll we'll, we'll figure that out. Big sexy man, sir. I I, I, I bow down to your. To, you know what, big sexy? I'm gonna let you take us out, man. You got it. Yeah, man. let big sexy take us out, man. You always taking us out. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm in, in my best Michael Dean impersonation. Do Michael Dean, where can you? people find you in the? Uh, where can people find you online? Uh, you can me? find me at podcastjuice.net. Uh, also, you can find me on Facebook, Michael Dean. You can find us on Instagram. Uh, so all that good stuff. You check us out. And Michael Bland, where can people yes, reach sir. you online? Oh, man. I, I, <laughs> I mean, Facebook is a good place to just get me, man. I have a, I have a, uh, I have a little makeshift website, but it's for private use only. But I mean, really, it's, you know, I'm I would almost uh, announce my email address right here, but I, I'm scared of what will happen. <laughs> Don't do it. Uh, I, I, what's I, what's I, this I private use it. website? What you doing over there, Mr. Bland? No, I'm just, I had to put it together. I got some business I'm working on. Ah, okay. I need to consolidate all my uh, my contacts and my photos and it can look good for a potential client. That gotcha. I, that, um, a, a, a software company. It's the professional that, uh, website is what you have. That yeah. It's, yes, I guess that's what it, it's not for. When you like, say private yeah. website, that's that to me. That's like, oh, what you, what, what are you doing over there? Yeah. Oh no! Yeah, see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not running a uh, uh, a, a leather site or you know, okay. Okay. Oh, you know, bonnet oh, hey, site. Oh, hey, whoa! What are you into? <laughs> <laughs> Telling on yourself? <laughs> not private. It's just business. <laughs> There you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. And I can be found at Twitter under WSE Mark, Facebook under Mark Wiggins, Face and Instagram under Mark Wiggins one. That's not no, that's incorrect. Mark Wiggins two and Instagram. And as always, working like a job and keep it sexy. We'll see you guys soon. <laughs>